I won't bang it as hard. Excellent. <laughs> uh, I'd like to call the Amherst School Committee meeting to order on April 9th at 7.05 p.m. And we're not doing Pelham. We're not able to tonight, no. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you in the audience, particularly um, those of you who are going to be presenting this evening. Mm -hmm. I'd also like to welcome everyone in um, our telev television audience <laughs> who have just come back from the polls. Um, and I want to thank you for uh, joining us for what I think will be an extraordinarily important session this evening. Um, I would like the members of the board to take a look at the agenda. Um, I think you already are aware of the main item on that ag on the agenda and how important that is. Are there any places in the agenda where people would like to devote more time than is allocated? If not, then I'm going to all again defer to Catherine for purposes of approving the minutes for the Amherst Elementary School Committee. Yes. Um, did everybody review the minutes, the Amherst minutes? Um, could I have a motion to approve the minutes of January 15th, February 5th, and February 26th, 2013? So I move to uh, accept the minutes of the Amherst School Committee meeting on January 15th, 2013, and the Amherst School Committee meeting on February 5th, 2013, and the Amherst School Committee meeting on February 26th, 2013. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion or? Okay. There was one small correction on uh, February 23rd. Uh, I'm sorry, the February 26th. Uh, in the welcome uh, section, it should be until March 12th instead of February 12th. And that's been, I gave that to Debbie. All right. All those in favor? Thank you. Great. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I'm also going to pass around Region, Amherst, and Pelham warrants. We not only have your car keys, but we have your paychecks as well. <laughs> so please make sure you sign those before you leave this evening. Um, okay. Announcements and public comment. Um, I would like to take, I know we have a, a, a very important item on the agenda this evening, but I'd like to take just a few minutes to deal with a couple of business items that have been brought to my attention. Um, the first one has to do with, they both, they all have to do with how the school committee conducts or does not conduct its business. Um, and um, I just, one of those that has been brought to my attention was the time that we allocate for public comment. And I just want to let the public know that we have made an adjustment in the website description of um, the public comment section of uh, the ARPS website to bring it more in line with what our policy is. And I also plan on um, suggesting to the Amherst, uh, to the policy subcommittee, that we take a look at our public comment policy as well. So I just want to let people who have been concerned about that know that we are acting upon um, your concerns. Secondly, um, there's also been brought to my attention that um, access to our agendas are um, not always possible. And I just want to make people aware that if you go to the ARPS.org uh, website, click on administration, click on school committee, um, and scroll all the way down, you get to the uh, agenda archives, which is complete and total list right on up to tonight of all of our agendas. And so um, I think, um, unless I hear otherwise from folks out there in the audience, um, I think that is a fairly direct route to mm -hmm. access our agendas right through the current agenda. So I, hopefully um, that concern can be put um, to, to rest. Um, finally, um, I just want to make a comment regarding um, what um, promises to be um, the highlight of the evening, if not of the school year. Um, and just a personal comment, if I may. Um, I hope that people who are watching um, out there in television land, um, that you will inform your neighbors, friends, parents of children, and residents of the communities that we represent about this evening's presentation. Um, this presentation is about teaching and learning, the very heart of what we do um, as, as school committee members, as administrators, staff members, and certainly as students. I can't think of anything, even beside the budget, more important to pay attention to than this presentation this evening. And so I would request that um, you let people know um, if they're not capable of watching this, 
that they uh, become aware of it and gain access to it online um, as it will be available. This is one of the most important hours that I think you can spend in preparing for um, acquiring more information about the experiences that your children will have uh, here in the Amherst Pelham School District. So I just want to say that, put that out there, underscoring the importance of this evening's presentation. Maria? Thank you. So um, I have just a few updates which I'll pass out to people and um, comment on a few and I, I won't spend a lot of time tonight because I want to get right to the presentation. Um, but I do want to acknowledge that we've been really fortunate that Amherst Education Foundation um, has awarded their grants for this year and our schools are, are receiving um, and are having four of those grants funded. So you'll see on top we have $20,000 that will, will be going toward the work at the high school. Um, which is for the incoming ninth grade students and, and the um, high school teachers will be working this summer to really think about the academic support that's provided to all students um, regardless of which classroom you're walking into um, and we appreciate that's a, that's a very large award. Um, I know Mark can speak more eloquently um, if people have questions about the specific awards um, but we, we thank AEF and, and the donors uh, very very much. We also have uh, 13,800, which is going to all of our elementary schools in Pelham, Leverett, Shutesbury, and Amherst, um, which is for Lego Robotics. Um, and they're going to be doing some work, I think, during clubs, um, during recess, and integrating into classrooms. We also are fortunate to receive $4,000 toward Family University for next year, which we, the committee's quite aware of that we have underway this year to be able to continue that work next year. And the high school science department received $11,225 to purchase some new technology, um, which allows students really to be um, visualizing, measuring, and graphing photosynthesis um, in real time. So people I know are thrilled um, to have these, these grants supported, and I know it, um, the relationship and the partnership with AEF has only um, strengthened over the past few years, and um, just publicly you know, thanking our community for support of our schools. Um, a couple of just dates that are coming up that people should be aware of. We have a Cambodian New Year celebration happening at, happening at Fort River on April 25th at 10.30 in the morning. We have African American Achievement Night, May 8th at the high school at 7 o'clock in the auditorium. And Latino Achievement Night, May 17th at the middle school auditorium at 6.30. I think there's just one other that I will mention tonight. Uh, actually, two others if I could. The high school chorale and hurricane singers under the direction of Anita Cooper. And if people have not watched our students perform, um, you're missing out. So you really need to go and see these um, young adults perform. It's, it's quite honestly breathtaking. And they won at this point gold medal and superior ratings Friday at the, um, and I'm not going to know what MICA stands for, M-I-C-C-A, State Choral um, Festival, Choral Festival. And both groups are going to um, invited to perform at Symphony Hall in Boston which is um, a huge honor and recognition. And um, these medals are dis on display at the high school in the main office. So please um, take a look. And then I think the other congratulations, and I'm going to probably not do a great job with these students' names, so you're all going to have to help me. I'm looking at Mary. Um, is it Alia? Alia. Alia. Um, Sarah Schwartz. Thank you. Clara Dehill Bow. Close enough, Bui. Thank you. Um, and Anchu, Anchu, and Jonathan Simmons. Simons. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. I should have just had you read this, Mary. It would have helped me out. Uh, for their medal and uh, ribbon award winning performance at the Massachusetts State Science Olympiad. And um, congratulations on the whole team who finished 12th overall out of 45 teams across Massachusetts. Mark Jackson. Please take, stand up so we can acknowledge you as well. Sorry, you have to. If you're here, congratulations to the students. So thank you. So I, you know, I hope everyone will take a look. And if anyone out in the audience wants me to, it wants to acknowledge anything else on this list that I'm kind of glossing over at the moment, please feel free. Um, but again, there's so many opportunities to really acknowledge the amazing work of our, our faculty and staff and our students. Um, so thank you. And before you all present, I want to just be able to say I thank our faculty and staff for coming. <clears throat> Often, they are very comfortable in, in presenting in front of students because they do that all day long. And we appreciate your willingness to come and present to the school committee. Um, and this is a wonderful group 
um, who's 100% supportive of the work that we're all doing in the schools. So I, I hope that you enjoy this opportunity um, and there's no stress involved. So um, <laughs> we thank you for all this work. I know I've been watching what's been going into this um, presentation and preparation. Um, so thank you. So can I just sure. introduce Dr. Please. Rhonda Cohen, who's going to um, start the presentation. Yeah, whatever, however you're comfortable. Do you want it down lower? I'm going to sit, yeah. Okay. But the question is, um, will it carry enough? Jerry, do you know how to, someone can do the microphone? I won't be able to. It's all the same, I think. Right. Let's see if that works. Enough? Just turn that thing and it should, it should. Hold on a second. We, oh, thank you, Jane. We need a few more of these. We might need a few more. There we go. <laughs> and we have both screens, so whatever Oops, works sorry. for people. All right. So. Let's see. It's working. It's working. Are you getting sound quality? Not really. You're not. Are we on? Jerry's going to turn it up. He's just running. He's sprinting. He's sprinting around. Let's try it again now. Okay. okay, thank you for the invitation to present the teaching and learning update. You'll see tonight's presentation focuses on two subject areas, both science and mathematics. It's the outgrowth of work that began in the fall and in the result of the collaborative efforts of teachers, administrators, department heads, curriculum leaders. We will begin by introducing who is here tonight. Um, so we're going to start out, well, over the past several months, I've had the privilege of working with my colleagues, Mary McCarthy, the high school department science head, Jane Moody, high school math department head, Dr. Ian Stith, the math science coordinator, to design the learning and teaching update. I'd like to publicly acknowledge the weekly meetings, the conversations, the insightful questions and data analysis that informed this presentation. Doug Slaughter, Mickey Gramaki, Mick, uh, Mike Morris supported our work as well as the questions we asked about our course enrollment, student performance, and demographics. Throughout the process, we've worked closely with the middle school and math um, science curriculum leaders. Finally, it's important to acknowledge our dedicated K-12 math and science teachers for the work they do each day to make a difference in the lives of our students. So we have a fortunate, we're fortunate to have a number of teachers presenting this evening. Several, um, several on this slide, we're going to go through who's in the room. And um, I want to acknowledge that our middle school math curriculum leaders were not available this evening, John Newman and Stephen, uh, and Steve Zier. Mm -hmm. Mary, do you want to introduce the high school science? Sure. Uh, right here is Dr. Jim Phones, um, ninth grade teacher of ecology and environmental science. Dr. Sharon Palmer, chemistry. Dr. Annie Clarence, biology, Mrs. Kathy McCarthy, no relative, <laughs> biology, Dr. Patty Blanner, physics, Karen Croft, physics. Excellent. Um, and also Zach Humble from the middle school, is a middle school science teacher, will be presenting some information about some formative assessment work that's happening there. Great. So the way we're going to get started is by looking at the science. We're going to share some information about the next generation science standards. We're going to share some ideas from our sixth grade program, since this was the year in which we had departmentalization take place, where that meant the teachers were teaching two content areas. We have our middle school information about formative assessment. And then there's a large presentation on our high school science program. And we're going to talk more about that and kind of how it's come about. But one of the things that is exciting about it is that I'm new, and the question that we're going to be looking at is actually about a program that started a revision process about five years ago. So the idea of the collaboration of I was trying to understand and ask questions, but the way the questions get answered in the presentation, it really was designed from teachers being able to say, well, this is how I would explain how our courses are aligned and how has it impacted our entire program. And then we're going to take a break because that'll be a big presentation pause for questions, and then we'll move into the second part of the evening, which is going to focus on our math program, K-12. So with, all right, so the next generation science standards, these are the standards that are not yet, that are in a process of being reviewed. They are different from the Common Core in that there isn't yet agreement across the states about what they're going to be. Now, what that means is that everyone is on hold in the area of science. 
What we do know from the early drafts, which is good news, is that at the elementary level, the standards are being written to be grade specific. And in the previous versions of standards, it's been things like it's a K to two or three to five. So for elementary schools for improving or aligning the curriculum, it's actually more difficult because there's an awful lot of choices about what to teach when. Mm -hmm. Now at the middle school and high school, it is very likely they will continue to be bands and that gives school districts the kind of the freedom to design courses on the sequence based on our programming and our, and our priorities. The learning progressions is coming out of a research base, which shows how, like, pays a lot of attention to what science content would be taught before another and how over time that would develop. The science community is, I would say, um, building on or taking or borrowing the notion of the mathematical practice standards, which have been very successful in terms of defining the conversation nationally about what it means to understand mathematics. So they've developed some drafts about what it would mean to know science. Um, what we're doing in our school district to support this environment where it's not yet clear what exactly to teach in what year at the elementary is we are moving forward with using with focusing on nonfiction texts and science as a core and there is a group uh, the University of Berkeley put together these materials that are both research based and focused on science inquiry and the careful reading of science as, as texts so we feel comfortable that given what's available in the field that the topics they've chosen to write units on are core elementary topics so there'd be no reason for us not to begin to look closely at what's being released in the field. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to have Dr. Stith talk about his experience with the sixth grade this year. Uh, so as Rhonda said, the, this year the science in the sixth grade has been departmentalized, so there's a smaller group of teachers doing all the science. So um, just some highlights of what they've been working on. Uh, Project-based inquiry science is a program that we've been using as a structure for the for the year, so that's really based on standards-based curriculum and uh, hands-on activities, students designing experiments and really going through that whole process. Uh, right now, they've had 50 minutes at least of instruction four days a week. Uh, next year, we look to make that probably more like 60 minutes, uh, and the number of days is still to be determined. However, it should be more overall. Um, <clears throat> and also just that now with the departmental model, everyone is teaching the same basic units across the different schools, which is a, is a change from years past. So we're having um, launching scientific inquiry was a unit, uh, ever-changing earth, solar system, and uh, everyone including robotics unit as well. All right, so um, <clears throat> I'm excited to talk to you tonight about some of the work that we're doing at the middle school in science. Um, specifically, we've been playing with a, uh, a program called Credit by Proficiency, and it's, it's something that has really resonated with the department and uh, that I am really thankful that I got to have some experience with when I worked in Oregon. Um, it being something that the uh, state has really pushed forward as, as a way to really reshape and reform a, a lot of the way that we think about education. Um, obviously, it would take hours to do it justice in my mind, but um, I'll do my best to cram it all into you know five to 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> that's fair, right? Sure, <laughs> so, no pressure, no pressure. <laughs> um, some things that, uh, you know, Credit by proficiency does. It encourages standards-based teaching. It creates a guaranteed and viable curriculum, helps develop assessments, clarifies learning goals for students, uh, facilitates differentiation for students with different needs, and increases opportunities for students to feel successful. Um, part of the reason we started playing with this in the first place is because we have been asked to take a lot of time to think about formative assessment at the middle school. Mm -hmm. And uh, formative assessment, of course, being assessment that happens during learning to assess where students are um, as we go so we can better inform the decisions we make um, as, we, as we progress through a unit. But looking at formative assessment alone isn't enough. We have to ask questions that go with it. Um, what do we assess? What do we do with the data from the formative assessment? 
And then how do we know if our strategies worked? And probably most importantly, what does it all look like to a student? Mm -hmm. So um, <coughs> starting with what we assess, uh, one of the challenges that we face is really sticking to the state standards. Mm -hmm. um, state standards often feel like a wonderful starting place. And then we often expand upon them. And then the next teacher expands upon them. Then the next teacher expands upon them. We end up with a unit that is in scope probably far greater than it ever should have been. Um, and credit by proficiency really challenges a teacher to refocus on what the state standards are, what the essential learning is. Um, and there are a million ways it does that. But one of the ways that I really am fond of is through rubrics. Mm -hmm. It... Um, it asks you to create a rubric for every unit and to use very specifically the state standards uh, to create a, a, an entire level of the rubric designed around understanding what it means truly for a student to be proficient mm -hmm. in that unit. Um, so really, it's about defining what success means. What is success for a student in this unit? Um, and you know, you can read across where it says, you know, meets, and you can see what it means for a student to be successful for cells based on those state standards. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't opportunities for extension. Um, there still is, in, you know, there are still other things that, of course, become incredibly interesting. But those are going to go into an exceeds category. Mm -hmm. And while that is something that certainly all students are going to get exposed to, it never takes away from the fact that those meets are really where the most essential learning is going to take place. Mm -hmm. So how do we know if our strategy worked? Well, we, uh, once we have a good rubric, it actually almost writes itself. Mm -hmm. um, so thinking then about the formative assessment, having really clear learning objectives makes it so much easier to formatively assess. Mm -hmm. Because on any given day, you can look at a specific learning objective and say, am I accomplishing this today? You know, how far mm -hmm. have we come today? And um, after a period of time in credit by proficiency, a, a student would be given an assessment based on those meets criteria. And that might be adapted from the summative assessment. Mm -hmm. um, it could certainly be, you know, any number of forms. But a student is going to be assessed on whether or not they can yet meet that proficiency. Mm -hmm. um, once they've shown that either they can or they, they cannot, we have to do something with those data. Mm -hmm. um, and this is just an example from my class, um, something I used a couple of weeks ago. The, their readings, um, they're both about photosynthesis, and they, they both certainly contain similar elements here and there. But the, um, the one on the left is designed specifically for a student who has not yet shown that they meet proficiency, and it's designed on really reinforcing that meets criteria. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that student has additional opportunities to, to access that material. Whereas the one on the right is designed for a student who's already shown that they meet proficiency, and therefore is designed to really emphasize that exceeds material. That's great. Um, we're not supposed to be black. There we go, <laughs> all right. Um, Probably most importantly is what it looks like to a student. Um, first thing that it does is having a, a clear rubric for a student to look at really clarifies the, the information for them. Um, students, one time I didn't give out the rubric that went with one of these units and a student was like, well, why don't you give us the rubric? Why don't you give us the rubric? Um, you know, it, it makes it, it, I think that the students find the information much more manageable when they can mm -hmm. see it laid out in front of them. Um, we've also had a really positive response from the special ed department mm -hmm. that has said that uh, not only has it helped with their working with the students, but that the students have actually expressed less anxiety mm -hmm. because they can look at exactly what it is they need to be able to do and, and the information is prioritized for them. Um, one of the things that I love most about this is that it shows the students that we're not going to give up on them. Um, that if they reach a point in 
the unit where often we might have just as an entire class moved on to extended information, um, but they're not ready, that we're not just going to move ahead, leaving them lost without the original information or the new information. Mm -hmm. um, that we really are reaching out to the students and, and showing them that whatever it takes, we're going to get them this guaranteed and viable curriculum. Mm -hmm. And in the end, what that does is it really creates a culture of success uh, where students are able to be successful either by reaching the exceeds or meets. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's really been an incredible process that we've had a lot of fun with at the mm -hmm. middle school. So and thank fun you. Fun is important. Thank you. So moving right along, we're going to move into our high school science program. And what I want to remind people is the question that we set out in the fall that we said that we would answer, which was to really take a, a, take a step back and understand the question about five years ago, there was a new ninth grade course that was developed. And one of the things that happens that when courses get added at the high school is things are very integral. And what it really does, it has an impact on an entire program. So tonight is really going to be, you're going to see, you're going to hear from the teachers about what that course looks like. You're going to see kind of what our assessment data looks like and where we're going. So without further ado. We had several goals when we restructured our program. Um, the, f the first year of our sequence was 2008 to 2009. Um, so last year, seniors were the first to go through four years of the full four years of the sequence. Um, so w what we were looking for was to have a common experience for students that would give them a good grounding in the core sciences. It's an integrated science that we're offering now. So there's some physics, some biology, some earth science, and some chemistry. And we also wanted to set a foundation for the laboratory skills and expectations for writing formal lab reports and all the things they're, they're going to be experiencing through their entire high school career. Um, so this, of course, impacted our entire program and affected curriculum up the line 912. Some of what we uh, did was replaced our ninth grade course, which at that time was earth science for most students, with a smaller number of students who met certain prerequ prerequisites taking honors biology. So we, we modified that to be all students taking ecology and environmental science. And some of the standard setting organizations that we're recommending and emphasizing the importance of environmental literacy were the um, American <coughs> Association for the Advancement of Science and the National Research Council, which had put out the science education standards for our levels. At this time, uh, there was no M MCAS in science yet, but we knew it was coming. <coughs> so that was part of our planning um, in revising our curriculum. And it was important to us to maintain um, elective choices for students and advanced placement offerings as well. And as with all our curriculum changes, we um, keep in mind our, the social justice commitment of the district. Um, in this slide, you can see the previous sequence compared to our current sequence. Uh, as you can see, the upper level options are still available that were available at that time. We uh, did change in the ninth grade, if you look at the ninth grade, we retained some earth science content. Mm -hmm. At that time, our earth science class was already a, uh, a hybrid it called Understanding Environmental Change, and it already was a combination of earth science and ecology, so it was a smooth transition for us. Um, this program change uh, helped us retain some flexibility in sequence where students could select between college prep honors or other options year to year. And what they take in ninth grade does not determine what they're going to take in 10th grade and, and thereafter. So uh, we were able to achieve the goal of maintaining the course options available. 
uh, both sequences had the option for students to take up to two AP science classes if they planned their schedule accordingly. So this was about five slides, which Rhonda made me <laughs> reduce to one. <laughs> are we aligned? <laughs> so um, there, are, there are three areas of, of um, state <coughs> standards. Uh, one is content, one is mathematical skills, and one is scientific inquiry. So this slide is referring to which of the standards are covered in the ninth grade course, the new ninth grade course. So uh, you'll see that there's biochem, earth science, and physics in the science content because it is an integrated course and it is introducing material in all of those areas. There's a significant amount of mathematics done in the ninth grade course by design, and all of the mathematical skills um, in the science curriculum frameworks are, are covered. These are some examples of some things that the students are asked to do. And for scientific inquiry, the students are involved in a lot of investigation, authentic investigation on our school's grants. And working in the field provides a context for the ninth graders for studying science. So what is the course like? We're offering them a field-based science. All of our other sciences, while we can take students outside, it's not a routine part of the curriculum and this is a field-based science and students routinely go outside and investigate our local landscape. So the first half of the course is ecology as listed there and the second half is environmental science. Uh, there are a lot of benefits to having a field-based content, I mean course, because uh, it helps students become really good observers and it's authentic because it's in their own area and they learn about uh, real real problems that occur in their own area. They also are doing um, guided inquiry where the students are doing real investigations as science scientists do and sometimes their data doesn't match each other when they collect things and so you know they have to think about that and ex deal with some of the real examples of science that you would have to deal with. We wanted to increase the rigor of the ninth grade science course because we had gotten feedback that it wasn't rigorous enough and we also had seen that. And along with that, um, we designed ways to support students who would struggle. And uh, for each lab investigation that the students do, they have a guiding question uh, that um, informs their work. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Jim Fones right now. He'll give an example of one such um, benchmark investigation. Okay. Is there a on the side? The pointer. The pointer. Okay. I need to use this. You do. You can take it out. Yeah, there you go. Hello, everybody. Hello. Thanks for having us. Um, this is harder to see. This is clearer, but this is bigger. So I don't know. Look at the one you like. I like uh, that one. The example I'm going to show you is one of our uh, investigations in ninth grade <laughs> science. It's ecology and environmental science. And this is the second half in environmental. And it's during our unit on air pollution and global change. So that's our context. And we're investigating global warming. And our focus question, as Mary asked, we always try to have a clear, understandable question I, that passes what I call my Aunt Eleanor test. Could I tell Aunt Eleanor what I'm doing? And she would understand it, because she's an intelligent person. But she's not a scientist. She's a nun. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so Aunt Eleanor would like to know that our question is, how much carbon is emitted? I thought this was a pointer. There we go. Whoops. How much carbon is emitted by the cars that commute to our school? So there's the parking lot there and there. That represents a population of cars that we can go out and measure and observe. We see them every day. So the carbon dioxide emitted from them is a greenhouse gas. And we're asking how much they put out in a school year. The second half of the question is, can our school forest absorb that carbon dioxide? And the, it's been somewhat cut off, but our school forest is right there. That's our study site. So we go out there and we measure the carbon uptake by that forest. Uh, and we've dubbed it the Amherst Regional Experimental Forest, or <laughs> ARF. 
<laughs> and so my, my dream someday is to have a brown and yellow Forest Service type sign that says ARF, and then I'll know we've made it. Okay, <laughs> so uh, can, how much carbon do they put out and can we absorb it? So notice, as Mary said, it's a field-based class. We're getting out of the classroom. We're measuring real things in the real world. Mm -hmm. We think that providing students with context is very important. It's important because many ninth graders are very concrete learners mm -hmm. to begin with at this stage in life. Also, later on, they'll be taking the other fundamental sciences, and they'll not, they, they will have some idea, why is this other stuff important? Why should I bother to go in here and learn this stuff? All right. So to answer the question, we have to <coughs> first uh, deal with the cars. Um, we measure uh, the population of the cars, we survey the cars, and we divide them up broadly into less efficient and more efficient than the current CAFE standard. And uh, we also do some survey work, how far do people live from school, and we look at the speed limit signs and discuss how fast people drive. Our second uh, expedition, on the next day is we actually measure the CO2 coming out of the tailpipes of running cars. Um, and this uh, slide shows you a CO2 gas analysis tube. The uh, gas analyzers that we uh, just won the grant for and that we already have a few of can't read high enough to actually read the car exhaust. So we need something less sensitive than those. So we use these chemical uh, tubes. Uh, we also measured the uh, velocity of exhaust coming out, and by measuring the cross-sectional area of the tailpipe, we get the volume. Volume times concentration gives us a flux. And then we, in a couple of pages of calculations, extrapolate this up to a whole school year of carbon emissions by our population. Um, these calculations, the students do unit conversions, they uh, use proper scientific notation throughout, and they round to the correct number of significant figures, which are the mathematical standards that Mary was referring to that we're meeting. So the second half of the project is the forest. Uh, we go out to the forest. We have to estimate the carbon taken up by a full growing year of trees. So we measure uh, tree biomass by measuring diameter and using standardized biomass uh, equations. We measure leaf litter actually in ecology, so the production of leaves we already know at this point. Uh, and we make a simple estimate of roots. We don't actually dig up roots and uh, try to estimate how fast they are. Uh, and you can take it from me that, that, that there are no question-free ways of doing roots, and they're expensive and prohibitively time-consuming. So we make a simple assumption. Mm -hmm. So we get the carbon uptake by our living plants in the forest, but we're not done because the dead remains of the leaves and other materials are still respiring and returning carbon to the atmosphere. So we have to measure carbon dioxide production <coughs> by the forest floor, which we subtract from the car carbon storage. And so the we get a measure of the actual carbon uptake by our forest in a, in a year, in a growing season year. And we compare that to the car emissions. And uh, the answer is uh, no, our forest can't take it all up. And the ratio between how many forests it would take to what we have is between 20 and 40. Sadly, the answer isn't 42, but it's sometimes very close to that. As a result of all this calculating and all this measuring and all this discussing, the students also write comprehensive lab reports in the format of a scientific paper. Introduction, methods, results, and discussion. Uh, in the honors classes, they also are challenged to write a brief but very specific abstract that goes with it. And so in these reports, they, uh, they combine all the data, they synthesize it, they say what it means. We also look at some factors of, uh, say, what society could do to reduce our carbon emissions, uh, we, based on some readings that we do, what are certain actions that that student feels are the most promising to take, whether it be hydrogen-powered fuel cell cars, whether it be people living closer to school, not commuting so far, whatever they choose goes into the interpretive section of this thing. Uh, and these are, um, of course, read very carefully. Uh, and that's our assessment of their knowledge and their learning in this activity. So there you have it. Uh, I hope a brief overview of our one of our activities. Thank you very much. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Is it there? Uh, the design work of um, 
Jim, and also Nick Shaw shown there, mm -hmm. the second from the right, um, has, has been recognized um, by a number of external sources. Um, the NEAF award, that's the National Environmental Education Foundation, they actually got this the first year out, identifying our school as one of the 16 US schools that was a national model for how to infuse environmental content into high school curriculum. <coughs> And the grant money was used to buy additional data loggers, such as you saw on the previous slide. And this, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, this, is, this picture is from that, um, mm. that event when uh, they were honored. And the factors that were, are considered for this award are innovation, use of local resources, replicability of the program, and a focus on energy efficiency, energy conservation, and renewable energy. Um, and you've already heard from Maria about the new mm. grant that's coming and Jim and Nick actually designed the lab for that as well. Um, we really want to thank the local professors who have helped us along the way with, with advice, materials, um, written to the newspapers, they met with the superintendent to support the scientific design of the course and we've, they've been a tremendous resource to us. And finally, we have had other schools um, seek information on how to replicate the program. It is rep replicable, obviously using your own local flora and fauna, which might not be the same. Um, such schools include Turner's Falls, Athol, and Sidwell Friends in Washington, DC. You've heard about ninth grade as the core course. Uh, if we look at our other courses, all are available as college prep or honors. We also have chemistry in the community available for chemistry. It's a, it's a different course that was designed by the American Chemical Society. Uh, we have advanced three advanced placement options. And um, the electives are, with the exception of anatomy and physiology, are, are one trimester electives. And they're heterogeneously grouped with an honors option students. The core design principles of the courses 9 through 12 in science um, incorporate the following uh, pieces. Because of the many learning styles that our students have, we try to use multiple modalities, um, be it ver you know, verbal, tactile, audio, visual, interactive, whatever kind of uh, modalities that we can integrate into a lesson. And mathematics, of course, is the, the language of science, so that's a component of all of our courses. Uh, in terms of technology, technology is actually part of our standards. It's, it's science and technology and engineering are all within the same standards from Massachusetts. And we've, we've gotten tremendous re um, support from the administration. Um, I'll, I'll name Dr. Gr <laughs> Mickey Gramacki for this, mm -hmm. for who's really understood the importance of helping our classrooms get in focus projectors and document cameras and a uh, portable uh, laptop cart for science, which we've really found incredibly useful. Uh, in all of the grades, students um, do labs in which they collect data and, and analyze their work. And you've seen one lab, which was the ni a ninth grade example, and um, now we're going to hear just from teachers of the other cores for um, a little representation of how their disciplines cover some of the same design elements. So first up are uh, Ms. Kathy McCarthy and Dr. Annie Paradis. Biology. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so this is a very fun lab that we do. The students uh, tend to enjoy it a lot. And we start out with a discussion of why cells are so small. Why are we made of 100 trillion cells and not a few hundred cells or a 1,000 cells? Um, so it, it turns out it has to do with efficiency in acqu acquiring and exchanging uh, materials with the environment. So we have them build a model of a cell. Um, this is auger. It's kind of like a, a, a more dense uh, gelatin-like substance. Um, so they, they cut out three different sizes of cells. The one on the left is three centimeters on all sides, and then one the next one is two, and then one centimeter on all sides. 
Um, and so they, they calculate the, the amount of surface area and the volume, and they put it into the, a, a beaker filled with sodium hydroxide. And there, there's a chemical in the auger that turns pink when the NEOH comes into contact with it. Um, and we, we also have a discussion on, on how cells exchange materials with the environment through diffusion, and, and diffusion is what's going on with the NaOH. So we wait about 10 minutes or so, um, and then they, they take their cubes out, and they slice them down the middle, and mm -hmm. the zone of pink represents how far the sodium hydroxide has diffused into the, the model of the cell. So representing what part of the cell would, would get nutrients or oxygen gases. Um, and if you, you can go ahead. Um, so these are students just measuring um, and, and building the cubes. And um, then they'll put them into the, the <coughs> beakers. Um, and Kathy will talk about the data interpretation. So this is an example of a college prep, uh, part of a college prep lab. It incorporates, uh, we're trying to incorporate as much math as possible, extending on our rigorous math standards that the ninth grade has started. Um, they do graphing, as you can see, and they answer uh, several questions. Now, the important thing about this lab is that it's a benchmark lab, and we do it at all levels. So AP does it, uh, honors biology does it, and college prep. So it's a common experience. We do ask different questions, um, different levels of analysis, definitely different levels of math, depending on what, uh, what level you're taking the, the class at. But it essentially gets at the same concept. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Sharon Palmer, who is going to talk about chemistry. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about a lab we just did in two of my classes today. So this is another benchmark lab that we do um, in the, all the college prep and honors classes. And it's another lab where we construct a model of something. And um, so this is a quantitative investigation of microscopic and macroscopic um, um, behavior of gases. And it culminates our gas unit. And so. Um, I'm going to do this on my honors class on Friday because we're doing the gas unit at the same time. And so, um, you can go ahead. So what the students are supposed to do is they're supposed to make a model of a car airbag using household, exp uh, a household ingredients. So you saw in the previous slide um, they were using baking soda, which in class I'd call sodium hydrogen carbonate, um, and acetic acid, which um, you see in your house is vinegar. So this is sort of a model of the, the first chemistry experiment most of my students have ever done, but they're revisiting it in a quantitative sense. And so we give them very minimal instruction and some materials, and, and basically with a, a variety of sizes of Ziploc bags and these chemicals, they construct a, the, a model of an airbag. So they have to have um, something that when it's sort of impacted is going to expand by creating a lot of gas. They have to do a number of calculations. They have to figure out the volume of the bag. They have to figure out, because we don't tell them these things. And I tell them you can't just look at the bag and see it, that it says a quart, because a quart is maybe a quart of sandwiches, not a quart of carbon dioxide gas. And so they have, to, they have to measure the volume of the bag. They have to calculate the amount of carbon dioxide that would take to fill that bag. And then they have to calculate the amount of the reactants that they're going to use. <coughs> so it's, um, it's mathematical, but it's also um, a model of a real-world application of chemistry. And they have a lot of fun with it, because they have to try out different ways of of combining the ingredients. You can't just throw everything in and zip it up <coughs> fast and hope that it inflates. Um, so I have to figure out how to keep things isolated until there's sort of an impact. And there's a little bit of, you know, they have fun with it because there's always a danger that they'll put too much stuff in the bag, might blow up. <laughs> and so they always step back. We al I always make them do it in the hood. <laughs> and, um, you know, so it's, it's kind of a fun lab to wrap up a unit. It ties up all the calculations. It ties up all the concepts. And it's a good way to review for an upcoming test. And um, I guess that's all I had to say. So I'm, I'm going to introduce Mr. Aaron Croft, um, who's going to tell you a little bit about physics. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, we teach uh, physics uh, largely to seniors, uh, but uh, there are some uh, juniors uh, mixed in with seniors. And we teach. Uh, 
all of our physics classes, we teach AP physics as well as honors and college prep level physics. All of our physics uh, classes study basic, uh, basic mechanical uh, relationships that we find in nature. And so in our next slide, next slide. Next slide, there we go. So uh, in, this, in this photograph, we see students um, working hands-on and with uh, computer-aided data collection in this one. So all of the, the students at all the different levels will be measuring motion, and in this case, measuring as they roll these, car these carts down these very steeply inclined tracks, how fast are they going and what, what rate are they, at, are they accelerating. So I just break it down a little bit in the next slide. Uh, it's a hands-on experience. They're collecting data. It's computer-aided, uh, so it's it's telling them about the motion, and then they're doing some analysis. They're they're making graphs, and they're given a model. They're told a model, or they read about it uh, for the motion on Earth, and they're then asking the question of, do our measurements match up to that data? Invariably, there is some some difference between the prediction and the measured values. So they're going to write about it and describe. Uh, what they've measured and what they expected and the ways in which they do and don't match up. Thank you. Thank you. We also have science uh, extracurricular opportunities available for the students. Teams is one of them. It's often referred to as the JETS because this used to be run by the Junior Engineering Technical Society. It's recently been taken over by another group. But there are competitions um, in technology, engineering, aptitude, mathematics, and science. And the students actually problem solve as a group. So we have a number of different teams in the library on a Saturday or a Sunday coming in for fun to <laughs> take a <laughs> test. And, and they, pro they problem solve together and they tackle different areas. There's usually a theme. It could be biomedical engineering. This year it was cybersecurity. And um, the picture on the right is our um, all girls team last year that scored first in Massachusetts and first in the national division. Great. Wow. <coughs> the Science Olympiad you heard Maria uh, mention earlier. So um, I'll just say that it's sort of like an Olympics in that you participate in a number of different events. So uh, students work in teams and they each are in three events, each team is in three events. And some are things you make ahead, like a bionic arm, and others are things, you know, they surprise you with the test or you may have to use a microscope to, to, um, diagnose something or perhaps it's something that you didn't learn in school and you decide it, it, the topic is ornithology and whoever takes that on learns about birds in advance. <laughs> so, so it's very challenging and very interesting and this, in the picture above on the left the students are preparing their thermodynamics entry where they have to construct a container that will insulate a beaker with fluid inside and predict how the temperature will change over time. Uh, we also have the Apes 9 Club we've been running. Um, this is our third year. Um, it's Apes and AP Environmental Science ninth grade. So this is for students um, who uh, would like to come after school and prepare to sit for the College Board AP test. So um, so far, all of the club members who have uh, sat for the test have passed it, with most of them receiving. Um, the score of extremely well qualified, the highest score. Uh, the other clubs depend on interest of students and availability of uh, advisors from year to year. This year we have Science Club and we have Environmental Action Club. And we also have a number of students doing um, internships um, at one of the five colleges or other local sites. Um, students have studied the science <coughs> of appetite. They've They've built polymers. They've done chemical research. They've transformed DNA. They're doing all kinds of interesting things with the mentorship of our local professors. And we're very excited. I think it was mentioned last week, but we're very excited this year because one of our students, Shohini Kundu, uh, developed a project from the research he was doing at the Geosciences Lab with Dr. Jonathan Woodruff on sedimentology and placed as a, a semi-finalist in the Intel Science Search, which is mm -hmm. the most prestigious competition for this age in the nation. We always, as a plug, we always welcome other professors who would like to mentor yes. our youth. <laughs> 
But we'll now take a look at student data. Um, our other question was what trends are we seeing in terms of <coughs> student data? We're going to look at achievement. We're going to look at enrollments. MCAS is first, as I'm sure you all know. That is the required <coughs> state exam. Students, all students are required to pass one science MCAS exam in order to graduate. The test is taken in 10th grade. And the options available are biology, chemistry, and physics. The majority of our students take MCAS in biology, with a significant minority taking it in chemistry. <coughs> in Massachusetts, there is no standardized assessment for earth science, and that was part of our decision making when we changed from having the earth science class. But we did retain a number of earth science concepts in the ninth grade class because it's such an important course science. There is an alternative assessment available for students with significant disabilities. Because the exam is administered in 10th grade, um, our 9th and 10th grade curricula are aligned to the state frameworks upon which the test is based. Here's an overview, um, looking back from when they did start to require a science MCAS over time. So I will try the pointer. This is my experience. Oh, 09, 10, 11, and 12. Uh, does it show up on the other one? It doesn't. Oh, no, I, yeah? I can't see it. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, anyway, I, I'm, I'm not as techy as I should be. Um, so so what's the data show, what the data is showing is a trend um, towards more of our students scoring in advanced and proficient, which are the two blue sections and, and a decrease in the needs improvement and in the failing section. Uh, here's, here's biology data for um, 08 to 12. And the, as I mentioned, the goal is to have all students scoring in the blue, the dark blue or light blue. Um, so we're not there yet, but we are getting closer if you look at the trend. Whoa. Oh, no. I look what I did. It's okay. <laughs> Instead of this. Here we go. Mm -hmm. All right. So the trend is uh, the red is going down and the blue mm -hmm. is going up in biology. Um, but we, we do have some students who aren't making it yet. Uh, I, I do want to say needs improvement in science is passing. It's different from mathematics and English language arts in that respect. Um, so that's one thing to just keep in mind. Here's our chemistry data. Also, you see a similar trend, mm -hmm. except that you see that no failures. We haven't had any students fail chemistry. Uh, related to the chemistry data, most districts do not test their students in chemistry. It requires a pretty high level of proficiency in quantitative reasoning. And uh, in in 2012, only 1,400 students in the state took the chemistry exam, in contrast to 49,000 students who took biology. So 75 of the 1,400 were our students. This gra graph is looking at subgroups from the most recent year, 2012. Mm -hmm. And we're comparing to the state, ARHS to the state, those scoring advanced and proficient. So that would be a combination of the two blue graphs that, uh, blue bars that were in the earlier um, graph. So in some subgroups, such as students with disabilities or current or former English language learners, our students on average scored twice the percentage of the state. And others, such as the Asian subgroup, our scores were more similar to the state. Mm -hmm. And here we're comparing ourselves to ourselves. <laughs> if we look at 2008 to 2012, these are obviously two different cohorts of students. Mm -hmm. uh, so we did look at the data in between the years to see what trends we saw. And we do find the same trend of a growing percentage of students in, sub in the subgroups who are achieving advanced and proficient. There's been improvement in the performance of our students in every subcategory with the largest gain in the Hispanic Latino subgroup followed by low income and students with disabilities. Mm -hmm. The largest gap to full proficiency is in the subgroup of, whoa, 
I did it again, of students with disabilities right here. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, if we look, going to 100%, there's a gap there as well. So uh, as an example, 71%, um, oh my god, I do this every time, 71% of uh, African American black students are advanced or proficient. But what you can't see on this graph is that um, the gap in, is actually in 2012, no African American student failed. They, however, that gap is made up by students who did score needs improvement. Mm -hmm. So they're not as far as we would like to see our students, but they, it's, it's not failing mm -hmm. in terms of the state. Another thing to keep in mind in looking at the subgroups is that if there's a small number of students in a subgroup, even one student make, um, can make a difference in the percent. Mm -hmm. And these are all represented in percents. A subgroup that's not seen on this graph is ELL, English language learners. And that's due to the small sample size. Mm -hmm. The success rate of this group has varied from year to year. Last year, we had no students in that category fail, but in the previous years, we have had students struggle. So we do consider them a group that we are, are um, paying close attention to. And we, we didn't include male or female here either. Females practically remained the same over the years, and ma the males improved. So we're now going to talk a little bit about students who have failed. When we think about what student, who's, which students are at most, most at risk for getting a warning or failing grade, we have small numbers of students who are failing, but we do find that they are more likely to be in the high needs category. This is a relatively new category, uh, only the, I think the past two years. It means that there are uh, students in more than one of the subgroups. Mm -hmm. Students with disabilities, which I see I misspelled, and um, Latino, Latina students, low income and English language learners. So as an example, well overall, we have decreased our percent of failures from 6% in 2009 and 2010 to 2% in the last two years. S so in 2012 we had five students who failed. Um, four of them were female and one was male. All 100% were high needs. Mm -hmm. All were, spe all were um, receiving special ed education services. Mm -hmm. And two were low income. One student had failed previously and was being retested. And two were Latino, two were Asian, and one was Caucasian. All of the four, four of the students passed in February at when they took the retest. That doesn't always happen. We sometimes have students who have taken it numerous times, even three times. If a student fails three times, they can then we can then apply for a waiver for them based on the cohort of students that were in their group. So this was data from last year that we're looking at. But I do want to say that our trend over time has been the students with disabilities, our highest group, um, who would fail. They fail at the highest rate followed by Latino, followed by low income. Mm -hmm. And in most years, we didn't have enough data for ELL. How are we supporting these students um, to move towards proficiency? Well, one thing uh, that's a challenge in science is that unlike English and mathematics, where students, if a student fails in English, the next year they're taking an English class again. If a student <coughs> fails biology, but they passed our course, the next year they're not taking biology anymore. And they're called upon to retain, mm -hmm. you know, a long time until February, some material that they already were struggling with. But because by then they most likely are in chemistry, a lot of them would be in chemistry in the community, which is not aligned with the MCAS. So we put other things in place. And um, this is another unfortunate piece, is that the state doesn't alert us as to who didn't pass until the summer, the end of the summer, mm. past the time when you could encourage someone to go to summer school. And you know, parents, guardians, and students are understandably reluctant to enroll in summer school on the supposition that they might have failed. So that's a flaw, but we do have a summer school program that's available for them, and uh, specific, um, specifically for biology. 
And last year we also have um, ecology support available. Since the ecol all the ecology standards are covered in ninth grade for the MCAS exam. We analyze the MCAS and we identify areas of weakness and we target those, uh, our instruction um, for the students with those. For example, open response questions we found that students have difficulty with and there are certain specific areas that we give them more practice in. We did offer a sup MCAS support class during the year last year. Uh, we do believe it, it helps students. There was a scheduling difficulty with that because we had a number of students who were recommended for the course, but very few of the students could actually enroll due to they were also struggling in other areas and had other special classes that they were taking, and it was hard to schedule. So this year we actually didn't, weren't able to run it. Um, we've also offered support through PRISM, which is the after-school program, uh, having a biology teacher and a special ed teacher co-teach it. Um, we do collaborate with the uh, liaisons and other support staff in the building who work with students uh, and have given them packets of MCAS questions and, and review materials. Um, special ed, ELL, and mid middle school science teachers, we also work with, but they don't, middle school teachers don't get the support packets from us. They have their own MCAS that they're looking at. But um, we also have the Academic Achievement Center that um, is a directed study that we've also provided materials for. And uh, we did run a trial um, of having a uh, Spanish, uh, one of our Spanish interpreters who's assigned speci specifically to science work with a couple of um, our ALL students who were also low literacy and they weren't ready even for the ninth grade because they came to us with ever without having much um, education past part of um, elementary school. And other thing we're keeping an eye on is the fact that um, some of our students complete their biology course at the end of the second trimester and they <coughs> then also have to retain information for a few months. So we have some review packets for them and Kathy and Annie are going to be offering some after-school review courses for them as well. Uh, SAT2 um, are the College Board subject tests. Many schools do not require these. Um, students tend to take them only if the colleges that they're interested in are required that they take them. Um, so students that are applying for programs in mathematics and science are more likely to take these exams. It's difficult to analyze because it's an optional test. Students are self-selecting to take it and um, therefore the comparative information is, is um, hard to come by. Um, if we look over the years um, from 08, which was before we restructured, uh, right before we restructured to this past year, uh, we look at the number of students that are trying and, uh, and taking the SAT two tests in science. We see a great increase mm -hmm. um, in all of the subject tests. There are two biology subject tests, one with an ecological section and one with a molecular section that's specific. And then there's a chemistry test. So we, um, our numbers have increased overall, almost doubled um, from 67 total test takers in 2008 to 120 last year. And the most significant gain you can see is in chemistry, which is almost double. Um, so the graduating class of 2012, as I mentioned, was the first to complete four years under our new sequence. Students from this class would have begun sitting for the SAT two exams in 2010. So overall, we're seeing more students opting to take the College Board subject test in science. Here are some comparative scores. Again, these are different cohorts because they're different years. It's a norm reference test and the norm is different every year. So mm -hmm. <laughs> this is just a snapshot of the three tests, um, grades that preceded our restructuring and today, so 2007 to 2012. We did look at the intervening years data to see um, if we saw trends. And we do see a, a general trend. There was one year that didn't, that didn't match, but the rest of them did. Um, our, our biology in both of ecological and molecular scores uh, routinely exceed the national average. 
And the molecular is especially high if you see, um, we're going to try to not fast forward this time. <laughs> there, seven or seven. Um, with um, the average being over 700, and 700 is considered a very good score. Uh, our chemistry does not exceed the national average, um, but as shown in the previous slide, we have a much larger number of students taking the chemistry, and when you have increased the number, you do tend to see a larger spread of grades. And what you don't see is the scores that um, you know, our highly able students are achieving. So just as an example, in the class of 2012, um, 15 students scored over 700 in the chemistry SAT2. And um, the thing that's unusual about this, <laughs> these scores are the way that we get the data is we get it by graduating class rather than the year the student took the test. <coughs> so this is why it says classes of 2007 to 2012. So students sitting in the school right now who have already taken these tests, we don't have the comparative data on until they graduate. So it's a little unusual. But we, we have their scores. And we know, for example, for the class of 2013, that's going to graduate this year. We know we already have 20 students with scores over, two, over 700 in um, chemistry, three of whom have a, a perfect score of 800. So our, our scores are competitive. I, you can't always tell from an average, mm -hmm. from an average. Advanced placement. Advanced placement, or AP, is an introductory college course that's taught during high school. So uh, this really depends on the college, um, how that's leveraged uh, when a student gets there. Some schools will give credit for students to opt out at the beginning year of um, their science class in that subject. Some will give you general credit but want you to take their own science, science um, sequence. And some do not, but it's still a useful thing to have. And um, taking an advanced placement course is an indication that a student is attempting a higher level of rigor. And we do know that many colleges look for that. We offer three AP courses. Biology, environmental science, and physics mechanics. Here's a similar slide in terms of what are our numbers looking like of students taking advanced placement science, science exams 2008 to 2012. Again, we see that there's an increase in all of the three subject areas. And um, I think it's interesting to note that this increase in students taking these rigorous courses is occurring during a time when our student enrollments have been dropping. Uh, since we changed our sequence, we've been running more sections of AP Biology and of AP Physics. And in addition, as I mentioned before with the APES 9 Club, we do have some students in ninth grade who have prepared outside of school for the test without having taken the full AP course, but they took Ecology and Environmental Science and they prepared for the course test. And the first year in which those students were tested was 2011. So the increase in test takers is correlating with students progressing up through our new sequence. And this is just a, um, a visual. If you look down at the bottom to 2008, um, the, it, the bar is all of the AP tests taken by ARHS students. And the darker color are the science ones. And since um, 2008, you can see that in 2012, we've moved to 50% um, of the AP tests taken are taken in science now, or at least as recently as last year. Here are some scores. The AP does not make national data available. They make global data available, uh, which includes national, but it also includes everyone else in the world who took the AP test. So. I've in included Global, Massachusetts, and RHS, and at the top you see that a, a score of one to one or two is 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 not qualifying a not qualifying score. Um, three is qualified, four is well qualified, and five is extremely well qualified. So um, this again is a snapshot for 2008 to and to of t 2008 and 2012. So if you read across. Um, you can see that um, we are above the global and state averages for all test takers. 
with most students scoring qualified or, I mean, well qualified or extremely well qualified. The average in most cases is above four. Another thing we looked at was course enrollments. What trends do we see? Our average number of courses taken by um, an ARHS student is um, four years. Um, of course, with an average, some are above, some are below, <laughs> but this is an average. So our average has gone up um, overall and also in most categories. Um, a, a typical for your full year course is four credits. You will see some numbers that are above four <coughs> years, so like 4.3. <laughs> you might wonder, well, how is it possible to get more than four years of science in four years? Um, uh, there are a few ways to do that. If a student doubled up, mm -hmm. um, took two sciences in a year, if they took AP Biology, which is three trimesters, so that's six credits, if they um, added a two trimester elective, I mean one trimester elective and uh, picked up a couple of credits that way as well. So um, specific subgroups that are, t are closer to three years are students with disabilities and Hispanic and Latino students. Um, our, our greatest increase has been in the African American student group over time. Uh, so in thinking about special education, um, the students in special education have some blocks already taken with their academic skills classes and that's going to limit elective choices and we have a s by far a significant majority of our students are mainstreamed into our, our science classes. We also have some separate science classes that are taught directly by special ed liaisons. And um, the average number of <coughs> years of science by Latino students decreased slightly but the number of Latino students actually increased quite a bit. So, so it's, it's not a significant finding overall. So we're pleased that our students are taking four years of science. And on average, we're now beginning to examine data related to enrollments of, in, of subgroups in specific courses. For example, honors versus college prep. So that's, that's work that we're undertaking now. So overall, going back to our revisiting our questions, what happened as a result of the restructuring of the high school program, science program, um, I think that you've seen that our courses are highly aligned with national and state standards. I believe last week the members of the school committee should have received packets indicating where, in which courses certain standards are covered, all, each standard is covered. Mm -hmm. And um, what trends have we noticed? Um, I think we, we can say that we see higher levels of student achievement. On average, students are taking more science courses. And as measured by external um, measures, students are demonstrating high levels of competency in science. Uh, we do have data to show that we're improving at supporting our at-risk populations. We are continuing to do this work through our intervention model. So I'll um, just close by saying what we're working on right now. Our current work. Our departmental goal is vertical alignment. We've, we've put a lot of work in over the years to, do, to achieve a high degree of horizontal alignment, meaning that mm -hmm. um, teachers of the same courses are using the same unit objectives, the same weighting of grade components, the same benchmark assessments. We now um, find our current work looking 9 to 12 to see um, if there's continuity and <coughs> growth as students are progressing through the grades in terms of expectations, application of skills and increasing proficiency. We're also uh, working with the eighth grade science teachers at the middle school on issues related to high school transition in science. Thank you. Thank you. Ooh, thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Time for some questions? Yeah, Science. So, so you're um, prepared yes. for questions. Would you like questions addressed to the entire group, or how, how do you want to proceed? Mm -hmm. Does it matter? Um, why, don't, why don't we start yeah, everything? With, 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 why don't okay. we see? Why don't we go to Mary and I? We'll see if okay. it makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Rick, uh, Mary, congratulations on it. It's really, Thank really you. Um, wonderful. I, I know you cut some flag for the ninth grade science program to begin with, but it's really 
shown to be a great success and um, mm -hmm. really congratulations. And this, I, I just hit three years on the school committee and this was the best presentation I've ever seen because it gave the, the background of core curriculum stuff, it gave some really specific examples of how kids are actually doing things in the classroom and then it showed the data about, mm -hmm. you know, what the results were data-wise, so it was really great. Um, and Rod is a good organizer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And what Zach mentioned about being really clear about what you're learning in each, you know, mm -hmm. part of a course really resonated for me because yes. I know when my kids were in school, they got really frustrated when they didn't know what they were supposed to be doing next. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's so critical, and I'm glad to see all the work being done there as well. So thank you. Shabazz? <clears throat> to all the teachers. Do you feel you have enough face time with our students? And is a trimester term better uh, for accomplishing the teaching and learning goals uh, than a semester system might be? I know who wants to. He just want to hear your opinion, I guess. Well, other people certainly jump in. Um, I think if you count the minutes, this is what I remember hearing when I came, because I came from a semester system, and I remember hearing that if you count the minutes, the minutes are approximately similar. I, I think, and this is, I'm speaking for myself, um, I, I think that um, you have a little less sync time, if you know what I mean, um, in the trimester system in that uh, students have to absorb a lot of material you do have a longer period, but there's only so much the students can absorb in a certain given amount of time. Mm -hmm. So um, that's one thing that I find having taught in both systems. And the other, I think there's a lot of benefits to the trimester system for many reasons um, that I've seen, you know, in teaching and also having children here. But um, I would, I will say one, I do have a concern as um, a department that has does have an MCAS mm -hmm. that especially for our students who struggle, yeah. um, there is a gap yeah. of, of several months when they don't have contact with the subject area and they're expected to recall it. So that's, uh, for me, is sort of an argument um, that's a little more semester. It's kind of political. But, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but we need to decide these political issues. We can't keep passing the buck. No, thank you. I think they're thoughtful people on both sides. No. Absolutely. Thank so you. So some other thoughtful people? Anyone else could comment side? on that? I've only had that Stand up and again. speak up. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> some thoughtful person. And again, we know you're speaking for yourselves, so it's really, we appreciate your speaking to the issue. Um, I've, I've only taught here, and I don't have experience teaching in a semester. Um, type of situation, but I but thinking back to being in high school a long time ago, mm -hmm. um, one benefit of the trimester is that you have fewer students, and I, f I, it's easy, I get to know them quicker. Um, mm -hmm. And also, you spend less time on average settling the class down um, mm -hmm. and getting everybody concentrated and, and, and focused. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, there was a, a, a difference between the students who took the, the MCAS finished, when, when they finished bio in the third trimester versus the second trimester. Um, so I, I think there's yeah. benefits to both, uh, yes. but it's hard for me to really say not having taught in a semester system. I, I will say that we're beginning to look at the MCAS data. Mm -hmm. Doug Slaughter's been helpful um, on that. Um, and uh, the data that Annie's referring to is that we, d we do have, we, uh, just a very preliminary um, look at one year of comparing um, grade scores, MCAS scores of students who completed their course in T2, the end of T2 versus the end of T3. And the um, students who completed it in T3, which is when the test is given, did have higher top scores at the higher end of the scale. Um, so I, I don't, I, it's too soon to say any more about it, but that would be interesting to see. Thank you. Anyone else? Catherine? Um, I just wanted to reiterate what um, Rick said. This was 
uh, has been so far um, a really comprehensive, um, wonderful presentation. I'm, I feel both jealous that I didn't have this in <laughs> high school um, and very fortunate that my, I still have kids in the system who are going to mm -hmm. be able to take advantage of this. And I joined the school committee as this was underway, but I do remember, you know, lots of questions about it, and I am just thrilled with um, uh, the clear and thoughtful um, success of it. Meaning, you know, uh, and and I and to acknowledge the amount of work that's gone into this, um, and just to get to Shabazz's point. Um, you know, and, and you brought it up in the presentation about kids, particularly kids who struggle. Um, I do worry about the gaps um, in terms of the trimester system. And uh, so, and I know it will be an ongoing conversation, but, but particularly when you're talking about, you know, I mean, first kids have the summer gap. So if you're ending the, if you're ending in the, at the end of the second trimester, you could go a very, very long time before you were sort of involved with science again. And that that seems hard to me, but anyway. Thank you so much. Thank you, and to all the teachers. It was great. Tim? Thank you. So um, I'm not gonna echo everybody else's sentiment. I'm gonna say the sentiment myself because um, before I became on the school committee, you might rem recall my entrance in the public service was actually serving on the committee whose auspicious goal it was to make this report that you guys have seen. So I'm not jealous. You know, I had something like this in high school. I'm jealous I wasn't a part of your committee. <laughs> I got to sit here with these guys. <laughs> um, it's not all bad. It's not all bad. The, um, the data about... Uh, the subgroup comparisons, it struck me that compiling all that data together, there was a lot of things that could have been teased out to try to answer the question of, you know, how well these subgroups are doing. The first sense that I got was I'm not sure how big these samples are, you know. You know, so what shows as growth or improvement could be one person or two people, and it could be different in, you know, from one group to another. Okay. And it also occurred to me that some of these people might be in two groups. So okay. what to make of this data was hard for me to, to tease out. And I imagine that you, there, there are particular criteria you'd like to tease out, especially in, in light of the, um, the, the insight of whether or not it, it might be better to go to semester or, or uh, uh, mm -hmm. trimester. You know, so that was, that was the point, but you started to make it. And we actually have looked at it a lot more deeply than we can present right here, but mm -hmm. just as an example, uh, saying that you don't know how many are presented, and you're absolutely right. Um, but uh, talking about the subgroups, I'll just give an example. In 2012, we had 23 Latino students tested, and 20 students, that was 87%, um, scored advanced or proficient. One scored needs improvement, and two students <coughs> failed. Right. So those two students represented a failure rate of 9%. Right. And so that, that uh, whereas in 2008, mm -hmm. we only had 17 Latino students, and um, th there were 47% scoring advanced or proficient, and that represented eight students. And uh, three students failed, which represented 18%. Mm -hmm. So right. it, it, there are a lot of examples. Some way to normalize yeah. this data. Yeah. Can't do it. This is, this mm -hmm. That's the whole. What you'd want to see a school district doing is knowing. What, what you want to see a school system doing is knowing their data. They knowing the students who are represented behind these statistics, and that's and that's what's evident here because it is not when we're talking about one or two students representing nine percent. That's when the numeric representation of the idea is lost. Right. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Shabazz. You mentioned that <clears throat> the state doesn't tell us who didn't pass a science test until the summer when it's too late for the student to be enrolled <coughs> in a summer class. It strikes Correct. me that there's two ways to kind of go with that. And that's one, how are 
since we really know the student, we don't necessarily have to wait till the test to come in. How are we really doing to kind of really encouraging that, whether or not they passed or, or, or not, to improve their skills? But then also, um, the other way is perhaps there's a policy recommendation we as a school committee uh, perhaps should be making to the state in regards to how can you maybe accelerate the time in which you give us feedback on these exams. What do you all feel about that? One thing is with the Common Core and the park assessment, that's moving to a model where we would get a states, school districts, would be getting immediate Immediate. feedback because the exams are going to go on to being computerized. So that is, in in the next few years, you're going to see a change in the data, in Mm -hmm. the currency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would have to say I appreciate your suggestion. Having come from a state that had state exams, the regents' exams in New York, and by the next day you knew how you had done on it. Uh, But in terms of not letting students fall through the cracks, we, we do identify students based on teacher recommendation and also working with the guidance counselor. Certainly students that are having trouble in the course uh, would be highlighted and we would suggest or invite them to come to summer school. Whether they take it or not is, is uh, family prerogative, but we, we do develop a list and try to offer it to all of those students. Thanks. So I want to thank everybody. This was wonderful and very impressive. And I have just a couple of questions for Zach. And it was, I found your uh, presentation, the the software you're using, wonderful about the proficient and exceeds. And I was wondering if uh, you and your colleagues have any information about how many students are going into the exceeds portion. Do we have any data about, is that, my understanding was that everybody, obviously, we want everybody to be proficient, and then if they indicate proficiency, <coughs> then the staff move on to getting some exceed tasks, so objectives. at various times, you know, students are, are showing proficiency. The oh, yeah, the Otherwise, Mark is going to yell again, so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's just giving me hand signals now. I know. So, uh, I, I think it's... Uh, you know, I think that the, um, at any given time, you know, a, a student might be at a different place, like, throughout the course of a unit. A unit yeah. So, you know, we'd begin a course really mm-hmm. focusing on those those meets learning objectives. Right. Um, and then as we go, some students would, you know, start to bump up. And then by the end, hopefully, you get lots of students who are, who are really experiencing a lot of the exceeds material, and part of what I uh, have, you know, experienced is that um, the e- even the students who are primarily focused on on really just meeting yep. the standards often get such a strong foundation yep. in that material that when it comes time to actually take the summative assessment, they actually can perform fairly well on lots of the exceeds material as well. And the summative assessment, I assume, does, <coughs> does it have an, an attempt to get to the exceeds objectives? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It does. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, too. So, Zach, are we at the place now where you as, are the science teachers within teams having some conversations around rubrics when you're looking at who's at the meet and who's at the exceed to ad- adapt your kind of instruction? Are you, are you doing that as an individual or are you doing that within your cohort? Um, so that's something that we as a department have been yeah. really trying to, to yes. tackle together. Right. Um, so it's, and that's part of what's been so fun about the process has yeah. been, has been the done a ton of work in a short period of time. Yeah. So thank you. Mm-hmm. Can I ask one, can I do one more? Um, and I'm just going to give a little bit of an elementary plug here for a second. So two years ago or last year, how many minutes of science did we have happening in our schools? Science instruction? Maybe 80 minutes in the course of a week. And what are we doing now in the course of a week? Yeah. 200. And next year, will that will be increased. So I just want to say the, the focus on um, bringing uh, science and social studies, but we'll get there later, another time, um, into the elementary day um, has been really focused this year. So I want to thank Ian and Rhonda for making that happen. And, and just to be clear, that's a, mis- that's a result of the um, departmentalization? Yeah. For sixth so grade. Those numbers 
referred to the six grades, mm -hmm. we are on a trajectory to increase the amount of minutes available for science instruction at the elementary level. We're matching that with curriculum materials to use that time. Shabazz? Just following on with what um, superintendent was asking. So the curriculum leader for the department, does that shift around? Is it still Kristen? Is it you now? How does oh, that no, it, it still certainly is Kristen. Okay. So, so does, it, does it rotate or does, uh, is it by seniority or how does that work? You know, I, I have to. That's what you have to say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I have to. You don't know that. Yes, sorry. <laughs> Use the microphone. I know. Let's give a sign. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Thank you. It, it does rotate. Folks uh, have an opportunity to apply for that position. Uh, and it's really by interest. Uh, there's no seniority. It's not the, the person. So it's it's person who feels like they've got the energy and some vision and, and is ready to kind of jump in. Uh, but as you can see, Zach's here. Zach's up. been a <laughs> tremendous um, resource to this team and, and made it happen. So folks, you know, are working together. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to, um, is it now in terms of the elementary school, is this going to move down now to the fifth grade as well next year, the departmentalization or? Um, for the coming year, we are only departmentalizing in grade six. Okay. It, it went um, to recognize the work that goes into departmentalization. It involves not only curriculum alignment and collaboration, but there are significant implications on how we can organize the elementary school day in terms of scheduling and the providing of resources in ELL and special education. So we feel very comfortable with continuing with the sixth grade work. We can certainly explore the idea in future years for fifth grade, but I know that was a question that was asked a year ago. Right. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Trevor? Uh, it's not officially a question, so I don't really want to take time. But I just want to make sure I understood that it is the departmental reorganization that has freed up these extra minutes, but not specifically for science, but just extra minutes. And, and, and there was something about what you last said that I wasn't clear okay. about. Right. Mm -hmm. So it, what happened at the sixth grade level is that by having teachers teach in two content areas, mm -hmm. what it allowed us to do across the system was to standardize the number of minutes in the four core areas. So one of the things was is that depending on the different schools, we couldn't guarantee that students were getting the same amount of minutes for science or math. And that, as a result of having that focus, the schedules were carefully aligned. So that would, that would be a very good um, um, benefit and plus for a potential region, which is always sitting in the back of our mind, mm -hmm. that if that model is carried across the region, we've now demonstrated how you can um, compare <coughs> apples to oranges and get something better out of it. Am I sp okay. misspeaking, Rhonda? Well, Tell me if I am. Um, it turns out, actually, to have the number of minutes be appropriate between the four core areas, it wouldn't matter if you were a teacher who was being self-contained what, what's possible is that when teachers at the, at the sixth grade level are teaching two content areas versus four, it allows them to go deeper in the content. Mm -hmm. So we're, what we're gaining is the quality of instruction and the focus in the subject areas. Okay. okay. Thank you. That made it clear. Any other comments or questions from members of the committee? None? If, if I may, um, I would like to um, express my appreciation for um, the demonstration that all of you have made this evening to your craft, um, to your art, um, to your discipline, and most importantly to the students that you work with. Um, it's truly exemplary, I think, the quality of the presentation, and even more importantly, um, the very clear quality of the work that you're doing. And I applaud you for that. Thank you very, very much. I do have a couple of questions, if I may. Um, one has to do with um, page five. Um, you comment, there's a comment there, a reference to the relationship between the alignment of the curriculum to the district's commitment to social justice. Oh, yeah. And um, a number of times this evening, people have made references to more detailed pieces of what I consider to be areas of social justice. But I'm curious, um, at this stage of your work, what if any, um, I don't want to call them conclusions, but maybe just observations 
have you been able to draw, if any, that are transferable to the work that you might be doing in the future in other disciplines in addressing the issue of social justice in the district? <coughs> Is that a clear question? I'm not completely clear, but um, did, clear. did you mean how well what was started in ninth grade, carry through? Well, I'm just curious what you've learned from so far. You, you're working with science and math, it seems, right. particularly aggressively. Um, and I'm just wondering what you've learned from that work that's transferable or applicable to other areas of, of you know, other disciplines. Is, is there anything? Oh, to other disciplines. I'm going to throw this Social open. Social sciences, other humanities. <laughs> Um, what I, I was hearing two questions. One seemed to be about the social justice commitment, which I would, might answer a different way, and the other is how is what we're doing in science applicable to other disciplines, or are there you other disciplines we could work well with? Is that what those. you mean? That would be great if you could answer both of those. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, when, well, in Jim's presentation, when he was talking about the carbon right. um, emissions, he, he alluded to a piece where the students are studying their carbon footprint, and they actually do some reflection on how could they cut down on their carbon use. And that's, I think, that's part of being an active citizen. And I think that's, that's in um, alignment with it's the social justice commitment. All of the core sciences incorporate some social justice pieces, but in very different ways. Like my discipline is genetics. So um, I mean, not genetics, it's <laughs> biology. Mm -hmm. Biology, but a lot of things come up in genetics. And um, uh, just as an example, I'll give um, that for my, my students, I have them read um, an article from Scientific American about um, is race real? And so it's a scientific article, but it's, it also addresses race as a social construct. And I think all of the teachers could give examples of their own way that they integrate um, such concepts into their into their daily work. I know that Patty does something when she's talking about Einstein, about his anti-racism work. And um, it's, a, it's a much bigger conversation, but I would say that people are attentive to it. I know Aaron um, weaves in women's role in astronomy when he teaches <coughs> astronomy. So there are many multiple ways of doing it, mm -hmm. um, some of which are content and some of which are pedagogical. And are you calling on everyone? And are you recognizing mm -hmm. what you're bringing to the table? And are you recognizing your own privilege? And there are so many things that are involved in it that are beyond content. Mm -hmm. So I would say we were attentive. Are we as attentive as we, we could maximize? Probably not. I mean, there's areas to grow uh, um, for all of us, I think, in that area. In terms of collab, you know, do you mean collaborating with another department, your other question? Well, I'll <laughs> save my question for interdisciplinary work for another time. You don't okay. have to answer Because yeah. I could go somewhere else on that. <laughs> um, I, I would say feel free to email me any questions. I will try to, anything that we didn't cover, other questions that arise, I'll be glad to get back to people. My other question has to do with the 10th grade bio and mm -hmm. um, the interventions that you're making. Um, by the time a youngster gets to the 10th grade, um, I'm curious what, if anything, you need from us to help you with more aggressive intervention prior to a youngster getting to the 10th grade and also mm -hmm. in the 10th grade. What do you need from us to perhaps, um, I don't know if stunt is the right word, but uh, to prevent <coughs> a youngster from getting all the way to the 10th grade mm -hmm. and then needing that intervention? What, what, what do you need from us to help you do that? That is a really good question, which I will also see if something immediately comes to my teacher's minds. Well, I knew Rhonda was going to go there. Math problem. Math program. Well, one uh, one thing <laughs> that <coughs> one one thing that seems acts as a divider in some ways in the sciences is mathematics. Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes, as you go deeper into certain sciences, um, the more complex problems involve more mathematics. So it is important that people get a solid grounding in, in that facility, in, in numeracy, um, as well as literacy. So I would say that that would be a piece of it. Um, I think we certainly appreciated and benefited from the um, intervention funds that became available at the end of last year in terms of it, it enabled us to to run an additional section 
of ecology, um, which was, um, it, it's a full course, but it involves some remediation and it involves some students who uh, weren't able to get through the course the first time because they weren't ready. And um, it helped us put something in place for a transition for students in eight, coming out of eighth grade to try to help get them ready for high school. So a lot of things come down to money. We always welcome funds. Yeah, I want to add, if I could, just to that, too. I think the focus on the pre-K-12 um, alignment of our work and intervention when students are struggling and early literacy, um, you know, mathematics, you know, strong curriculum and, and alignment as well as intervention and the ability to use data well so that we can identify when kids are struggling. So all of what you were all talking about at your levels that we really and it's the work that we've been doing in teaching and learning to bring um, this coherence and, um, and a systemic way of intervening with kids. I think that's where we make the difference so that we're, we're, we're starting at pre-K. We're not starting at eighth grade, ninth grade. Um, but there's resources clearly connected to a lot of this work. Um, so ne next budget cycle. Michael. Yeah, I've, I've been uncharacteristically quiet. I know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to respond to the the social justice piece because mm -hmm. that was um, I'm the social scientist, so um, mm -hmm. it's clearly important that we're doing the you know the foundations and the learning and the mm -hmm. presentation is fantastic. But I just want to underscore sort mm -hmm. of what you were talking about, weaving in the yeah. other questions about race and role of gender and stuff, because I think. <coughs> Although you need to know the foundations and have the strength of that, it's it's really I get excited to hear that it's sort of there's also the other part because going to school and just learning the stuff mm -hmm. without seeing the world around it, mm -hmm. it's I think you're getting a little bit of fears. I just wanted to commend you because I think that's what makes you know this kind of education rich beyond just really competent and strong. And I think the kids deserve richness. So thank you. I think it does evolve attention. You know, because I, 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 all of us, when we apply to the district, there are essays on that topic, yeah. social justice, and how can you contribute. And I think we have to police ourselves to be really mm -hmm. attentive to that when we develop curriculum. So it's just a piece. Joe, thank you. Kip, you actually reminded me that I wrote a question on my paper, too, about that social justice thing when I first sat on the committee, some of you guys might remember, one of the first questions I asked was, in reviewing what our goals are to the curriculum, this social justice piece always felt too touchy and feely to uh, uh, try to quantify. And you very well articulated, you know, it, race is a social construct. Social and justice are both, you know, uh, uh, perceptual. It's both what you think it is. And so there's the potential for different people to measure that differently. So when we are describing being thoughtful about whether our curriculum is responding to social justice, we ought to be responsible enough to define mm -hmm. what kind of categories we are um, responding to. So what you described as um, 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 being a good citizen and why that, why that would be considered social justice should be um, um, just that answer of why. And then uh, uh, the other applications of social justice, that's a quick thing understanding of why that's considered social justice. Taught to the students, taught to the school board, taught to anybody who um, peruses what the curriculum is, mm -hmm. how that has to do with social justice. I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Thank you very, very much. Um, thank you. Should we take a short how break? How about a two minute break? Two minute so break? That can thank you very, very much. Thank you so much. Break. Thank you all. <laughs> <laughs> We don't have, oh, here we are. Ruckus crowd. Okay. Thank you. All right, Rhonda. part two. Okay, we're going to take a look. Yes, we're gonna take a look really at our, for our math K-12, we're really focusing it in this presentation, you'll see, on the six, eight, six, nine band of work. Um, what's interesting about this presentation is that I am absolutely confident that my colleagues, Jane Moody and Ian Stiff, 
all three of us have worked a lot on these ideas since September in terms of developing and understanding. So it's really what um, it represents a lot of different people weighing in on a complex um, issue, which is how do we ensure that our students coming from the sixth grade going into the high school have the highest quality kind of most rigorous math curriculum. So to ground our work, our kind of test or criteria criterion that we use to say, are we doing the right thing? It's we are providing it. We want to create a program that's rigorous, meaningful, and coordinated, standards-based, and engaging curriculum for all students, and that we look towards understanding and watching the data on how many students are prepared to, to succeed in advanced math courses in the high school. And things that we look for is our research, our research-based curriculum materials, the extent to which we are differentiating our instruction, the, our commitment to professional development in the teaching and learning of mathematics. And then there's criterion-based assessments. That's been added. It's not something that I'm going to go into great detail in, but it's an important idea to begin to get a hold of is that nationally and also at the school level and in classrooms, what we're looking at in order to assess student learning, we're taking specific standards and developing tasks to understand does a student understand, is able to know that, that skill and at what level. So that's a shift in the field in the sense on being much more careful and thoughtful on what does it mean to be proficient in an area. So we're going to start with giving you some information about what's been happening on our year one of implementation with everyday math. And we're going to have, since Dr. Stith has been leading that work, he's going to speak to this. <laughs> So some highlights of the work uh, from this year uh, that <coughs> myself and the math coaches meet weekly uh, to do a variety of things, including just organizing the, all the materials that are required for the first year and also anticipating issues that teachers are going to have with upcoming units and so forth. So the math coach and I are really um, trying to be in front of a lot of those topics. Um, and then there are the math coaches and I, again, are making different uh, materials to help the teachers transition into the new program, including giving them tips for what things are upcoming in the unit, um, different ways to organize their thoughts around how to approach a unit, um, and pointing out different ways to differentiate and um, also how to use the assessments um, in, in a better way. Um, so then also the math coaches, this particularly this year, and I have been working on um, connecting the intervention more with the program. So there's a w this is an ongoing process that we're going to be refining over, over the next years, but uh, really making a concerted effort to connect our intervention program with the core curriculum more intentionally. And uh, also along with this, it, it's important that we have all the digital resources uh, organized and that's an ongoing process as well, but uh, making everything organized for teachers to find and they're not searching for things when they need them and so forth. It sounds minor, but it's actually a big <laughs> important topic. Um, so then again, some things that we've been working on this year just with the teachers are how they actually planning their lessons w and we've been doing working with them um, both at the district and the, and the building level and giving them advice about pacing this year uh, and sort of as Rhonda talked about with the criterion uh, based assessment that's another part of everyday math that we're still working on um, what that really means and how to implement it um, taking advantage of all the differentiation resources and w being able to just logistically make it work in a classroom and then also mm -hmm. taking advantage of the huge amount of technology resources that come with everyday math, and that's still an ongoing process, but uh, we are making um, headway there. Um, so there's just some general things that there is a lot of appreciation for the technology and also the amount of and quantity and uh, quality of the differentiation options that are available for teachers and the supplemental resources that we've also purchased. Um, and there's also just more learning around how to use the cyclical nature of the program, particularly the math boxes and how that prepares them for um, some standardized tests and so forth, but also just how it reviews content in a systematic way. Um, and then there's also working with parent communication is another topic, then that's connected with homework and uh, what they refer to as study links and uh, home links. And also the unit letters that go home with every unit describing to the parents what's upcoming mm -hmm. in that unit. Uh, and then uh, we're st we've been doing for most of the year a, a structured coaching model so that the coaches have access to a sub so that they can work with uh, teachers and the teacher team can work with itself 
uh, more effectively around particular topics in that grade level. Uh, there's a variety of issues that they worked on um, over the course of the year. So that's been an improvement too that, w that the teachers all have access to the coach in a scheduled way. Okay, so this is how we go about doing the math review. And the first thing that when we look at, w when we look at cur the curriculum materials, as you might recall last June, we said that we set a target that we would identify curriculum materials for grades six and seven, and that we wanted the consistent, pu the same publisher to eliminate the amount of kind of teaching and the trans to support the transition work. So before you go looking at materials, it's very important to understand the context in which you're working. And so given the timing of the Common Core standards, it's important to kind of keep in mind that that's impacting what's available in the field and also our review process. So to, it's important to understand that now the, sta the standards, they're clearly, they're separate from grades seven and eight. What happened was in the earlier version of the Massachusetts curriculum frameworks is that they were once a band, seven and eight was together, and then they did kind of an artificial separation. And one of the claims that would be made is that it's repeating, eighth grade is repeating seventh grade. And the new standards, seventh grade is seventh grade and eighth grade is eighth grade. Another change that is significant is that 40% of the algebra standards that were in high school are now in the middle school. That's an important piece to understand for our presentation and what we're going to be recommending because what it means is that the country is shifting what we need to teach in middle school. Another aspect that's come in is that modeling is a, actually a conceptual category within the teaching of mathematics. Statistics is playing a much clearer role in teaching. And then this other, um, this other piece, which is the PARC assessment, the Partnership for Assessment, assessment of Readiness for College and Career, that's going to be that test that half the states in the, in the United States will end up taking in two years. So that's also informing kind of work in the field about what should we be doing in the middle school and high school levels to prepare students. The other piece of the equation is that we'd want to understand what is our data telling us now about the context of, of Amherst Public Schools. So we're going to take a look at our, at our advanced <coughs> placement student performance data. And we have a very nice story to tell. And it's very interesting t this evening how we've matched the science review with the math. Because um, am our data show that our am Amherst Regional High School students are actually among the highest performing in the state as represented on performance on the BC calculus exam. So what's interesting about, and th these represent what, if you, this information is publicly available on the Massachusetts website, the D DESE, Department of Ed website, where it calculates where, who's taking the calculus courses. So as a percentage of the number of students in the high school, we're at 4.2%. Turns out the BC Calculus course represents three trimesters, which is equivalent to two college-level calculus courses. Okay. I will step back for a minute to remind people what is considered in the United States to be high school mathematics. It's four years of high school mathematics, which is, in traditional terms, people would say algebra one, algebra two, your geometry, your trig, kind of pre-calculus. That is the standard. We would say if students had met the standard, they were successful in that model. Then what high-performing school districts do is they have the three, they have calculus offered in that fourth year. We actually have 4% of our students taking two years of college calculus in our program, and we're succeeding. Now, our number is a little bit, just to, to, um, for full disclosure, there's another exam, which is the AB calculus co course, which is also considered a very high measure. The school districts would love to have that number. So we have our AB, cor that course. So it, if you combine the AB, the students taking the AB, which is one year of calculus, with the BC, that number is about 5% of our, of our students. So, and when we look across the state, <coughs> we're still in that kind of high group of sc school districts that are offering the high, you know, the AP courses. Now, another piece of data that we'd be interested in is how is our MCAS. Mm -hmm. So our MCAS shows that our 10th grade performance is 87% are proficient in math in 10th grade. That means 13% are not. Mm -hmm. okay. So when we look at system level work, what we want to ensure, we want to watch that number because basically you want all of your students to be proficient. So, we ha so we're in a school system which 
we actually have data that show we're doing quite well with are we meeting the needs of the most advanced students? Yes, we are. The question is, are we meeting the needs of this larger group? And we're going to give some data that suggests that we have places where we can be improving. So for example, we know right now that 13% of our ninth graders are taking pre-algebra. And that's, I think, I think we figured out it was like 40, it's like, oh, maybe it was 33 students. But it's, it's a large enough group that that's, that's middle school math co content being taught in ninth grade. Now here's some information about low income. If we compare right now the students who are in 10th grade are taking a year-long algebra course in 10th grade, the second year of high school, 50% of those students, more than 50%, are low income. Okay. Mm -hmm. If we compare that with what's the number of low income students in the calculus courses, it's 9%. Mm -hmm. So we know as a system that we want to look at what are we doing within our organization of courses to ensure that all students are actually accessing and succeeding in our math courses. We also know as a piece of data that we've shared before is that our current model in the high school is our high school is offering 11 courses in ninth grade math for incoming, our kind of our, our outgoing eighth grade students. Now they're doing that to be responsive to the needs of students, which <coughs> means our middle school program, which is the result, which is result of our elementary program, is we have students in lots of different places in terms of being prepared mm -hmm. for math courses. This background is important as we talk about what we're going to propose for our for organi organizing our seventh grade math our seventh grade math program. Mm -hmm. um, so we did check our data, and similar to the science groups, that our subgroup performance, like if we compare our subgroup performance with the state, we do better than the state, generally speaking. However, here's which relates to our national data is that in the state of Massachusetts. 70% of Latino students are not proficient in mathematics I at the seventh grade level. So that's <coughs> achievement gap. Our numbers aren't different. But what, what we are in a school district, which is ap very committed to in, in terms of actually changing that achievement gap, mm -hmm. and part of what this work tonight is about showing is how do districts go about doing that. So we're going to talk about our process and what we've been doing. So we started out, um, the three of us meeting in September, and part of our mission was to be calling other <laughs> school districts. We wanted to understand what content, what math content was being taught in middle schools. We wanted to understand what are the instructional materials that districts are using. We wanted to understand the grouping practices, leveled, heterogeneous. We wanted to understand how acceleration <coughs> is happening. We wanted to understand intervention models, how is homework. So we had a, a quite an array of really wanting to understand what are the best practices? What are other school districts doing? And we also had a vision that it would be important to be reaching out to our parents and guardians and teachers and students to be understanding <coughs> our current program before we, were, before we kind of went in the direction of these are the materials we need to change because it was a much broader question to look at. So Ian's going to speak about what we did in our conversations. Uh, so we reached out to a number of uh, school districts, uh, referring to the type of topics that R Rhonda just stated. So some of them were just based on um, schools that were recognized as high performing on the MCAS and so forth. Some of them were uh, based on similar demographics. You know, we can't find something that's exactly perfect, but we were able to do some comparison with uh, low income levels and school size and so forth. Um, and then there's also the MSAN districts that we have the ongoing relationship with. Um, so just in a sort of anecdotal way that some of the things that came across as we look through, talk to all these school districts, um, is that everyone's struggling with the same kind of issues that we are in terms of reacting to the increased standards that we, w from the Common Core, and also dealing with, um, you know, how to really make that transition from elementary up to the high school and get kids prepared for where they want to, what courses they want to access when they're in the high school. And it's a complicated problem, and everyone is dealing with it. Uh, in their own way, and they're all struggling with it right now. Um, uh, so there are some things that it basically turns out, you know, that there's just a variety of ways to access this, and there and there's many schools that have um, different levels at, in the middle school, and there's a lot of schools that have heterogeneous groups in the middle schools. There's a lot of schools that are using, uh, or I should say there's many texts that the different schools use, and they're not really a dominant middle school text that we were able to identify. Um, and you know, that just reinforced that 
we need to make it work for us and and to to draw off what is what what they are doing that is uh, reassuring to us and what is working but then also there's not just one right way to do this you know that we really have to make it work and a, a big part of that again is connection between the middle school and the high school in particular so that was another thing that came out of work talking to the other school districts that they all recognized that was a problem some of them were able to work uh, with the middle school and the high school together and some were not everyone was in a different place of starting the high school working its way down or con converse so I think that we're in a good position there as we've been thinking this through um, in terms of how we might change things at the middle school and what the impact will be years from now in some cases for those students. And then also what can actually work practically and logistically and what uh, we're prepared to implement in a time frame at the high school. So that's uh, very important. Another thing uh, it's not up there, but we I reached out to um, John Starr at Harvard who has done work with algebra. Um, and again, that similar kind of conversation just around that people around the state and the country are struggling with, you know, simply in some cases just how to label courses in the middle school and what the implications are of giving mm -hmm. a different, a specific course a t uh, certain name and, and what that really means for that student moving forward and how that connects to the high school. Um, so, for example, the labeling a course in, in a middle school algebra it might mean that it actually covers all the algebra standards. It might mean that it's some sort of middle school version of algebra and there's a huge variation in what people actually how people label those courses so that is that is as an impact as we compare ourselves to other districts too because it isn't just a simple of question of are you doing this course in the middle school it's more complicated than that um, <coughs> considering the variation um, and he, he also just talked about how um, you know that everyone is struggling to really better define what it, algebra in particular really means even with now with the increased standards as Rhonda said more than 40 percent of the old algebra standards being middle school content so it's make, forcing us to really s question what are the right things that are in middle school what are things that really should be in the high school and these are all current topics uh, being discussed at the moment Thank you. So we have in front of you a diagram that represents a way which we imagine we can be organizing our math course in the seventh grade. So here's how the model goes. The top arrow represents, a what represents one math course and the bottom arrow represents another course. And the concept is, is that we would want the courses to be parallel enough in the um, sequence of content so that students could actually move. What we're looking for and what we, when talking to districts that have been successful at having more students take advanced math courses, what they're we're telling us is pay attention to what you're doing to allow the transition. Are you creating, for example, a summer course that allows you to move up? Are you being careful about your sequencing so that it is possible and how do you use perhaps like an intervention to allow that movement? And that that would be a design feature that if we paid a lot of attention to that, it also would allow us to more closely align the intervention work. So this, mo this diagram also represents that there's an extended window op opportunity for movement. And that's the idea is that when you have two courses is that you don't want to, usually the beginning of the course, it's the easiest because they're closest. But if you're, if you're really, you want to look for where the places, where are the transition places mm -hmm. that allow that to happen. You wouldn't want it just to be able to say, well, if students are doing okay at the beginning, they can make a move. So that's this idea of an extended window. It's aligned and that the intervention goes with it. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're, we're going to share now the, do you want to go back? Yeah. Okay. kind of got it. You kind of got it. The, we're going to come back to the, the we're going to use it between again. Are, yes. Uh, moving from one class to, a, to okay. another class, what, the transition points. What it could be is that let's say we had course one mm -hmm. and one A. And let's say the course one had more rigorous content in it. What you'd want to be able to do is make it possible for the student to actually move into that more advanced course because they were ready, they were exceeding expectations in the one A course. So, and it also means that if students were in a, a more advanced course, and they were not meeting the criteria to be in that course, they could go to a course that would be at the pace that would match right. their ability to learn. Because what we want to go do is make sure that students are in courses in which they're being challenged and there's rigorous content. Thank you, Rhonda. So the acceleration practices that are currently in place in our district is that at the high school level, there's doubling up, which would mean you would take four tri trimesters of math in one year. So one of those semesters, you're taking <coughs> two math courses. 
Now, there's also a self-study option that has criteria about what it would mean to do self-study. So it does, in this case, require a 95% test aver average from your current course. There's a portfolio that's representing concepts and skills. There's an 85% on a final exam. And then there is a requirement that the student work with a teacher or tutor or parent guardian with strong math background. It's my understanding that if there's been a case in which there might be an issue about where that support would come from, is the district has been responsive to not kind of keep students out of that opportunity. But that is the current design for the, for the high school. The, um, at the middle school, we have a practice that was in place only recent, actually in the last three years, in which our sixth grade students have had the opportunity to take a high stakes math exam to determine whether they are eligible to take Algebra one in seventh grade. Now high stakes, what that meant, what that means is that students sat for an exam and they had to get a certain score on that exam and that would determine whether or not in seventh grade, which is from six, you took this in sixth grade, you would go into an Algebra one course, which means you did not take um, the middle school, ma the first middle school math, the seventh grade math course. So that's what currently we're now going to offer some more information about what, what that practice has kind of result, what information we got back. Mm -hmm. So as you might imagine, there's been concern shared by teachers, parents, and guardians about the high stakes exam. One of the things about this exam is that the content is not taught in school. So it means that we're asking students to sit to take a test. We haven't prepared them for it. And then they get a number to say whether or not you would be in an Algebra one course. Mm -hmm. The other thing what it's done is it's created a strong incentive model for parents, t families, to seek out out of school tutoring mm -hmm. to be able to pass this exam. There are equity issues related to that. Mm -hmm. There's also that we, we, I mean, when we listen to the teachers and say, the sixth grade teachers, they get to observe the student fr frustration of taking a test. Mm -hmm. We have experiences in which kids have taken the test, not passed it. Their parent has paid for tutoring over the summer. They have taken the test again in September, have not gotten the, the number t to be in the course. And so that kind of, as an educator, watching and knowing that story, that is an unintended consequence of the high stakes math exam, okay? Mm -hmm. Benefits. Students in seventh grade algebra one do appreciate the rigor and challenge and the opportunity to take geometry in eighth grade. Okay. Another that's what so that's one piece of our story. Another piece is is that the math teachers they are teaching two courses simultaneously. That refers to in seventh grade there is an option to when you're in the seventh grade course to do the honors option, which involves doing extra math homework and doing extra assignments. As the classroom teacher organizes the class, there are, in that, in that period, time when the teacher will spend time specifically with the honors options. So it's an interesting piece, but it, I, I mean, it really, from the perspective of teachers, it's a design piece that they are actually teaching two courses with the same students. The honors option is self-selection, so that has also implications on who's selecting to do honors level work. The other piece is that we are all very recognized that the middle school curriculum has to be updated and revised because of the new common core st standards and the rigor. So we can thank Betsy Dinger. She organized student feedback. She, um, some, there were some focus groups on a couple, well, it was done before uh, March 19th to hear what students were saying about their experiences in the seventh grade. So one of the things that um, one of the things we can see in their comments are that they are appreciating their teachers, they're appreciating hands-on learning and challenge. They also recognize and they comment on having standard expectations for all students. So the students recognize, well, if you're doing honors work, you're being held to a higher standard for homework. So it was interesting that the kids reported back. And they're also commenting on the pace of instruction. And so it's interest. So it's just I, like we take our cues. Our youngsters know what it looks like to be in a classroom when it feels like it's a good fit, and when it's not. So it's just interesting data to hear from the students what they're talking about. So one of the comments from the non-honor student was instruction often does not feel useful when it targets honors level work, and vice versa. An honor student had mentioned the pace of instruction can feel slow. So we're going to propose something that would be different from what currently exists, is that the courses being offered next year, there'd be two courses. 
there would be a grade seven math and there'd be a grade seven math advanced. To determine the placement, we would use multiple measures of student achievement. We would use the MCAS information that we have from the last few years from grades four and five. We would look at the MAP assessment da data, which is norm referenced. We would use the end of unit assessments mm -hmm. from everyday math, the e what happens over the course of a year. Mm -hmm. The students have been doing open response questions and we'd also have teacher recommendation. So what, what when we look <laughs> at this data, we say, given all this information we have about our students, why would we need to have students take another exam? And that question came out also in our, in our feedback. We had parent nights with sixth grade parents and with seventh grade. With the sixth grade parents, we're genuinely asking, why do you, if you're doing all your assessment, why do you need a separate assessment? So I think it is a very valid question. We would, we would say that we actually have the data to make the recommendation. Now I want to go back to that important diagram. Mm -hmm. This is a really important, to kind of understand what we're talking about. So one important idea is that to determine what we're going to teach in the middle school, it is a combination of seventh grade, eighth grade, and high school standards. Beca that is what high performing school districts do. You actually put some of your high school standards in your middle school program. What we want to do in the work that we would be doing this summer with the, with the high school is to be th figuring out and identifying what would be the appropriate high school standards to put in the middle school. What we're imagining now, if we look at this picture, is that there would be an advanced math seven and there would be a math seven. Now here's a really important point. We want to have this, the students, when they finish middle school, to be able to be on the trajectory for calculus. So at the very beginning of this presentation, so there's four years of high school math in this country. If we want students to take, to offer the opportunity to be prepared to take a calculus in that, in that 12th grade, it means we have to compress four years of high school math into three years. So the work that the high school is doing, and this is why it's been so important from the very beginning that Jane was working with us, was we wanted the assurances and the thinking about how would we design that high school to be able to get those three, year, three years of math, four years of math in three years, and we wanted to do it such that students who were not necessarily in, that high, in the advanced seven course mm -hmm. could still take that calculus mm -hmm. course. Why? We want to extend the window of opportunity for movement. Mm -hmm. so, th so this is what's anchoring our thinking about how to do this well. Mm -hmm. Now the other part of our conception, our kind of our model, is that we will be able to identify the students, let's say it's 25 to 30 percent that are in the seventh, the, we don't know the number till we look at our data to see who's, couple things. We were gonna, we'll, we'll have the recommendations in, in June. However, we wanna keep in mind that in the, four, the, four, the first four to six weeks of next year in the middle school is that there could be a determination that a student could be moved to the more advanced class or vice versa. So it's not about saying this is the end all or be all, but we do need, we would move forward with our first recommendations about the placement, mm -hmm. right? So we could kind of get that piece started. There's another piece, it's the intervention, okay? We go back to our core ideas that what we are setting our school district to say is that our criteria in math courses is that students are in rigorous math content. That's, that we want, we don't, we, our goal is that we don't get phone calls in our advanced class that my child is not challenged and we also don't want to get phone calls in the advanced core, in the regular seventh math that my child is not challenged. Because then we have not fulfilled our responsibility, which is to have engaging, rich in curriculum. So to ensure that that happens, we are looking very closely at our model for intervention at the middle school in the seventh grade for math intervention. Because here's what we have to make sure, is that the seventh grade course is a rigorous course. And that if, if teachers have students, which we can predict, who would be struggling, we don't want the teacher to feel like, I can't go, I can't continue with my program because I'm struggling with a student who doesn't have the background to keep up with the program. So our, and the reason this matters is there's two kinds of intervention. We have done the work of ensuring that the, we, have pro, we, have we have materials that, are make, that we use to, when we've identified that a student is weak in fractions. 
we have a research base, they're called Math Navigator Materials, which we call GAP. We go and we help the student learn the fractions they don't have the background knowledge. You need another kind of in intervention to support students in the classes, which means I'm in a class right now, how do I succeed today with today's responsibilities? So the intervention piece that we want to expand and which we're paying a lot of attention to is that second tier of intervention. We need to have both to be successful to make the model work. So this is why the design considerations has involved and the, co the work that's going into this is how to make the middle school schedule work because we want to be able to be able to show that we can have students move to the two between the two groups, which is an implication for scheduling. We also, in terms of which is, we were not ready to do the selection of the text yet because now we actually know what it is we're looking for. We are looking for texts that are going to allow us to have two courses that run parallel. That's going to be an important factor. We're also paying. We're also have to. We're working with the sixth grade teachers on the selection criteria in terms of the multiple measures. And then there is the school home communication with parents in June. There's the family and the communication and outreach work to help people understand what it is we're doing, why we're doing it, and how to ensure what our, like, it, it is a big idea. And how do you, in lots of different venues, help people understand what, we're, what we've proposed? And then the other piece of work is that will begin, the, I mean, it's actually begun in the sense that because from the onset, um, Jane has been right by our side to seeing can we do this, but the work worth working with classroom teachers this summer to see what should be in the middle school, that work is going to, I mean, that's going to be like our frontline work for next year in the summer. So right now, it, interesting, similar to when I was here talking about when we were looking at the elementary math textbooks, interesting in the field of mathematics, there isn't really long lists of middle school math curriculum options. And we've called that we did our due diligence to see what are people using. So right now we are on a fast track to understand which of these sets of materials are most closely aligned with the common core. I can say that one thing that we did find is that one of the set of materials for sure is that they are, they in their way of organizing the changes is they offer a way in which a school district has access to every year a new set of workbooks that students use but they're updating it annually and they provide you the electronic resource. So they are managing the changes by basically making contracts with school districts. We're going to go with you as the changes come forth and what our job is to see how much of they already how much of their claims right now. Everybody who writes something will claim that it's common core aligned. The work right now that's analytic working with math teachers, working with the math coaches, Ian and Jane, is just really having people look closely at what's going to give us the most flexibility because we, because they're close, they we're already aligned to the, to the state, to them, the common core. Um, let's see. So the, our goals are, is we've got to be able to identify exactly which standards we're teaching when. Our core math text, we're on a fast track. This, number three, is making sure that our math courses are transparent. That would be, th and when I say transparent, not just to you, is that an ordinary person can know, what do I learn in middle school? What, like right now, navigating the 11 courses at the high school, we could put it on a piece of paper, but that's on a transparent process if there's 11 different options on what you would take in ninth grade. So it's really being really clear for kids to understand, I learned this, this comes next, and this is what I'm doing. And then it's the, it's the intervention program. So our professional development that is that we are working, um, we, we heard tonight about the embedded professional development model we have going on at the elementary level. Um, Dr. S Dr. Sith also does work with the special education department. He's working right now with a study group with kindergarten teachers to identify and create authentic assessments for kindergarten. We also have teachers that are going outside of the district. In one case, Kathy Fosson is doing really wonderful work on Common Core for little people. And so we're having two math coaches and a second grade teacher go into that training. We also have Ian's working with the middle school. They're, 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 they're bigger project about writing across the curriculum is he's been working using the mathematical practice standards and the writing to make a connection to that work. We are also looking for, um, we're going to use some grant funding to still allow, to have teachers attend the summer math program at Mount Holyoke, which is about developing deep ideas about mathematics. And then we, our partner, we are still part of the partnership of Western Massachusetts Math. And they offer, like July 1st and 2nd, an institute that brings math educators together. So, w so we're basically, we're paying attention to any organization that's working on these problems to ensure that we're best informed in making these decisions. 
And so we're going to hear from Jane because she's been working quite closely with our high school department this year. You're wondering if she was going to give me a slide. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so our focus um, this year has been really on the Common Core practice standards, which are the habits of mind uh, for mathematically proficient students. So for example, it would be persevering in problem solving, making a justification for an argument, um, those type, types of things. Um, so the administrative uh, team at the high school has been great. They've supported us during late arrival days to work as a professional community um, learning community around the practice standards. Um, so I've taken some stuff that I went to a conference uh, last summer that the NCTM, the National Council of Mathematics Teachers, put on and I've taken some of their materials, uh, their readings on the practice standards and we've done readings within our math department to try to really understand and unpack the practice standards. What they would look like in the classroom, what types of tasks would support the practice standards, and um, how would we assess them at the end of the day. So we've done some work using a case study that began with how do you plan, what kind of tasks could you identify, what kinds of questions would you ask, what would the classroom look like, all the way through assessment. <coughs> and uh, um, through that work, we have been actually practicing with each other. So we've identified some tasks. We've looked at them and said, well, could we change them just a little bit to incorporate some more of the practice standards? And then what kinds of assessment questions will we ask to get there? Um, the reason why we've been focused on the practice standards is because that's what's new to us. The content is there. It's just a reorganization of the content. So that's really, we really need to norm ourselves around the practice standards before we start looking at curriculum. Um, so our... Um, We've also used some planning tools that we've implemented into our classroom and come back and sort of discussed how that worked and how well the tool helped us foster the practice standards in the classroom. So our next area of focus, we're not gonna leave the practice standards because they should always be incorporated into <coughs> all of our work, but our next focus is really working on the content standards um, with special attention right now to the eighth and ninth grade sort of alignment coming through for um, the summer work that we're gonna have to do. So Jane, you're gonna become a lot more popular within the next year on the presentations because the real work is going, <laughs> is, is <laughs> besides the alignment, which sounds like that sounds like that has some kind of idea, you identify which standards go where and how they get organized. But one of the things that we're putting a lot of thought to is this notion of cohort. So when a school district is transitioning math from one, when you're reorganizing your sequencing of courses, you always have to keep in mind what have, where are these seventh graders in the process of transitioning? So for example, our current sixth graders had everyday math and they'll have the new program. So that will be a different experience a year from now. So that's a different cohort. Then we have another example is that our current eighth graders are going to go into the system that, still ex that we still have going on, our current system, in the high school. By next year, we may be in a different conversation depending what, what makes sense mm -hmm. for the student. So that's an important piece in terms of being very responsive and thoughtful to what the students are right now. So I, I just think it's, it's a very complex set of, I set of ideas and changes, but what I would say is that the way we're going about do it is it's like methodical and thoughtful because what we're keeping center is well what's the student going to experience we had we did get an interesting question from a parent and said well could we just keep everything just the same for next year because we did some changes in um, sixth grade and my answer to that is a couple things is that there's no question in my mind that our students benefited from the standards-based math curriculum in sixth grade okay that set us up for much more kind of consistency coming into our seventh grade. And the other point, the other way to think about this is that our district has put resources to impact our mathematics and our students who are in that sixth grade to have a really wonderful experience next year. We're putting in the new resource, why would we wait? We're putting mm -hmm. in the support, the intervention, is that we wouldn't want to wait another year if we actually have the ability to make a difference for the cohort of students. So it's in this bigger things we can all predict in like the next seven years there's going to be changes in the field but as a responsibility is that we always have to think about 
who are the students today? Yes, the country hasn't figured this all out, but we have a responsibility to do to look at what we're what we're our cohort of students and create the best possible resources and math experience possible. Now we are going to say our next steps are, which is that we are working very very around the clock right now to see which of the materials, and we'd be able to come back to be able to say like which materials and why. But we're not there yet. Um, we are looking at that while well, we're organizing the professional development and curriculum work for this summer in June and into the summer. And then tonight, this is a recommendation to Maria Garrick about that we would we are recommending that Math 7 be the course offered next yes. year in Math 7 Advanced. Mm -hmm. And I will just end on saying is that it, by putting these two presentations together, there's something that's very common between them, is that in both departments, the way in which we're approaching curriculum is saying how do we ensure that we can provide a guaranteed viable rigorous curriculum aligned for all students and we're using data to figure out how do we improve the system it's a systems level work to say what's going to benefit students over the long haul so I was it was really wonderful to have the science kind of analysis work prior because it also helped set the stage of what a district does to make the movements that would make a difference so that's our presentation. Thank you very, very <laughs> much. Thank you. Thank you. Questions, comments? Michael. So I'll, I'll just start by saying it's impressive and thank you. And th but I have a specific point slash question. And it's a couple. So the first thing you were saying that you consulted six our sixth grade teachers. Did you go to Shootsbury? Yes. Okay. So we so here's what we did. We set up first. I personally went and met with the principals, and then out of the principal idea, it was the idea to host at Leverett to do a parent evening that that, that Shootsbury was invited. I then am being invited to come visit Shootsbury to catch up, but technically they were invited, and so. But the reality is, it just I, I think you've had a lot of different things going on. But the concept is, in terms of our vision right now, we've also been reaching out to the common school. Like we're we're ensuring that anybody who has students coming to us has the information that we have. That's one piece. And the other thing we're doing is that it's very important from our perspective is that when we're looking at um, negotiating kind of what we can get in terms of resources, in terms of materials, is that we're going to make sure that we count the number of teacher kits to really let the, pr um, let the publishers know that we have feeder schools and we need to be able to provide access to our different schools so that they know what it is that we're teaching in our sixth grade. So, and I would say once we figure out like uh, what our training is, is that anybody who's connected to us will be certainly invited to participate in the training that we're doing. Um, and that we are, we're working with a much larger cohort than any of our other, like they're just are smaller. We're, we're actually working like in our side, but we're definitely, I will make sure I visit and set up an e evening for Shootsbury so the questions can be answered. Thank you. I, I guess I would just follow up. Yes. That, that, was, that, was, that was the perfect, great answer. Um, so just my sense is, you know, we're talking about regionalization. And so even if the, this speaks to more cohesion, so clearly that's a point. But even if we were to regionalize, you know, there was discussion about sort of not mm -hmm. necessarily like we just talked last week yeah. about that sort of throwing the curriculum to the wind, but sort of <coughs> figuring out how you transition over time. So as long as we're thinking about the way you described it, where even if we were regionalized at elementary level, that we might be differing for some short period of time while we transition. That that's does I mean, Shootsbury is not making it easy in lots of different ways. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, I think it sounds like you're trying to figure out how to bring people along and mm -hmm. get to the seventh grade place with enough right. stuff. So thank you. Yeah, and the other thing that we're thinking about is that earlier um, Ian mentioned that one of the things in the field that's really tricky for us is we can call a school district and they say it's algebra, but no one knows what it really is. That, the way we get through that conversation <coughs> is that people identify what standards are being taught. So when we can say, these are the standards we're teaching in sixth grade, and by the way, we're gonna take a seventh grade standard and put it in sixth grade, mm -hmm. not today, but that would be a trajectory, because that's how you do as the students raise in proficiency, you're able to move the standards down, generally as a general practice. But anyway, if we are transparent on which standards we're teaching, because of the way, this is how we're organizing our work in the field, is that presumably there are lots of ways for students to meet that standard. Mm -hmm. And so, and we can be transparent on, here are our assessments. This is how we know that our, our students have met the standard. You can figure out how, how to do it. 
and I'm just in general when we are working with any of these kinds of decisions, it's really important on our end is that we get the best possible number of resources for the least amount of money. So even the work when um, when we go and we look at these other sets of materials, one of the one of the ways in which you approach this is you let the publishers know what another vendor is charging, which is how we ended up getting the everyday math materials. Is that we kind of make sure we know our work and say, you know what, we're tight on our resources, or this is the pop, you know, so that we try to really be very careful with our resources, um, and and we are sensitive to the small, the, the elementary schools that are smaller, and we will share anything we can, like Thank anything, you. and make the other thing the district is investing in on our end, is um is the um, the curriculum mapping software, mm -hmm. which will begin to be a place that it is web based that we can make what we're doing transparent. So, Thank you. you're welcome. Other comments or questions? <laughs> None. I'm saving it for you. Shabazz? Yeah, you, you always get the last word. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I want us to be clear <clears throat> with, with regards to the recommendation for these um, two uh, classes in seventh grade math. Um, one uh, could see a scenario where this winds up with a challenge <coughs> that this is somehow creating racial, ethnic, or income tracking, which we've had an experience in this district once before. I'm hearing the, um, the, the prophylactic uh, um, addressing of this in terms of, you know, that there is this, these multiple ways in which uh, multiple measures of who will be in one and who will be in the other. And I'm also hearing, I'm also looking at uh, and hearing your presentation around this graphic of um, trying to have strong content in both classes such that folks can can move as appropriate and, and one isn't isn't the slow class and the other one isn't the good class but rather that they're both good classes but they're uh, they're proceeding at different different uh, pacing uh, uh, with different goals and if one finds if one is in one area and needs to go to the other uh, because of where they are there's there's the possibility for that kind of movement and I hear that as as a way but in terms of why make this shift um, we pride ourselves on being data driven but what's presented here is anecdotal <coughs> program feedback and anecdotal student feedback what is the research telling us as to why we should rec why you would recommend us moving in this way as opposed to differentiated methods of instruction that could be maintained without separating kids out into these two different classes so part of um, so part of the there's research that would suggest that ability grouping benefits in mathematics and there's research that suggests that it doesn't that heterogeneous grouping is the way to go so when we look at where our system is, like if I had a choice in education, would I have pure, would I, I would say I'm biased to heterogeneous grouping. Mm -hmm. And I bring that bias because I know high quality instruction and that you can have content and students can access this, okay. Then I look at where we are as a system right mm -hmm. now and I look at the, where we are, we've already, I would say we've already failed in some mm -hmm. ways. Not in some ways, we failed. Mm -hmm. Because if we look at the range of students who are currently in sixth grade, I'm looking at a pragmatic issue. Mm -hmm. So we could be in a school system that says tomorrow, we will have a purely heterogeneous math program in the middle school. The reality is, in terms of the pragmatics of it being successful, mm -hmm. I'm not, I, it's, it, when I look at where, where, where we are right now in terms of what's been available, I don't see the feasibility. I would love to be able to propose it. So it's really about looking at the range right now. And what I can say is that the test, the test that was that is being administered now in sixth grade as a high stakes exam fits into the qualification <coughs> of significant issues about yes. issues about equ equity. It is hard to suggest that that assessment is a fair and equitable way to determine who would take an algebra one course and a geometry course in middle school exactly on a trajectory in high school that would afford chances. Mm. So it's mm -hmm. a very, it's like a case that we would want that if we were doing our work, 
Yes. We'd look at that first. Mm. To go from that level of how, we've been, how this system has been orienting itself to a complete heterogeneous move, well, in school systems to make the moves, to make the changes on where we want to go, you've got to do it in a way that the system can be successful with it. Mm. So what the model represents is to kind of remove some of the barriers that actually was making it very mm -hmm. hard. Because if you, were, if you were not in that geometry course in the middle school, mm -hmm. your likelihood of ever learning with that student who took geometry in eighth grade, I think would be very, very low. It'd mm -hmm. be hard to conceptualize how that could happen. Mm -hmm. So what I hear in your statement is actually things that I'm very, uh, I wouldn't say just me, we have sat and we've had conversations mm -hmm. about the importance of access and equity and high quality instruction. Mm -hmm. The other piece of this is that we want to recognize in the field of learning, the teaching of mathematics, what it takes to skillfully do that well. That we, we can consistently read the research that says that as a field, we are not sufficiently prepared to actually meet the criteria in the field, which would be to have high quality math instruction. Mm -hmm. So it's not a perfect solution. Mm -hmm. I would say that all of us are mm -hmm. very, very sensitive to who's where and what can we do. I know that we're interested in finding cases in which if there's anyone who can actually be and we can provide the resources, this model allows us to do something we actually couldn't do given the other model. Mm -hmm. At least I, when I say mm -hmm. I don't want to say you couldn't, I said I'm not seeing a logical way mm -hmm. to have actually done that on any kind, in a way that I could be authentic to mm -hmm. what was going on. So we've actually made visible and transparent a practice mm -hmm. that we don't see an argument that's needed to continue. Mm -hmm. And we would love to be able to have classrooms where all students are together. Mm -hmm. We are making a choice and we are not mm -hmm. interested in a 50-50. Mm -hmm. We're not interested in putting, as if you could arbitrarily decide that 50% of the kids should be in one class and not the other. Mm -hmm. So the reason why I use the term criterion referenced, kind of the assessment, is that if you're going to be in that advanced course, there's going to be criteria to stay in that math course. So that it's like, uh, for right now, it's, like it's kind of like when we also said that everyone struggles with this. If there was a magic bullet or if there was a way to do math education well, we would have cases of it. So I would say we're setting ourselves up for a trajectory to be something mm -hmm. to be proud of in a number of years, but this is the messy part. This mm -hmm. is the part next year where we're working with this. The, and I also need to commend our seventh grade and eighth grade teachers, presumably, because mm -hmm. the, our seventh grade is that they will next year, in this model, <coughs> be teaching two different courses. Mm -hmm. They will be a set of new curriculum materials, and they will be working with students who are at different levels. The other piece to, um, that we've also talked about is that in that advanced course, there has to be just as much, there has to be differentiation no matter in your advanced course mm -hmm. or not. Because there will also be in an advanced course some students who are more advanced. Mm -hmm. So this is not a notion of, oh, that group is all, that that's going to be the easier course to teach. It really is about designing courses where the criterion is, is it challenging <coughs> and rigorous for the students in the class, and if not, what are we doing about it, and what are the supports are we putting in place? Well, that's the same in both classes. Absolutely, yes. But one of the following two. Um, <clears throat> understanding the importance of, of language, what I'd recommend to your recommendation yeah. is to rethink the term advanced mm -hmm. and maybe think yes. about the term vectored. And so you'd have a seventh grade math and a seventh grade math vectored. It's uh, it's a nice math word I learned yeah. along the way, but uh, I think about the diagram you showed right. with all of the, the arrays mm -hmm. going this way and that way, being able to move this way, move that way, and it made me think of vector analysis. But anyway, but just some <laughs> other word that doesn't necessarily, um, th that really yeah. gets at what you described, and that is a way in which to have strong, rigorous math at the seventh grade, challenging to all students in those particular classes, and enabling students to move where it works best for them. Mm -hmm. No, I think the language is, and it is a wrestling term. Um, one of the things that we didn't say explicitly that is getting lost in our terms and that is not widely used in middle schools is the notion of honors, okay? Mm -hmm. Because there isn't honors. There's your course expectations, so there aren't some students in that same class. So the other thing to be aware of is our current model mm. isn't necessarily equitable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if we were to look to see who is doing the self-selecting to mm -hmm. take the honors portion of the seventh grade course, mm -hmm. we're not going to see our subgroups making mm -hmm. those choices. Mm -hmm. So 
the reality is that this isn't what we have right now. What we're looking to do in a system is to actually change the dynamic to increase the possi possibility of a difference. Um, we are certainly, entered. we'd be happy to entertain some other word besides mm -hmm. advanced. We can put on our thing and see if we can come up with another term, because I do hear the latent mm -hmm. language that's connected, that it also gets connected to the word honors. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, so they're advanced, so that means I'm not. Mm -hmm. So I think, that's an I think that's an important feedback, mm -hmm. and see if we can find something else. We are making some choices right now to call things like Math 7, or at some point, a map, presumably something that allows the flexibility to get the standards mm -hmm. that go in the course without having to change the name, mm -hmm. right? Because right? that allows us, here's what we teach in sixth grade, we're increasing the rigging by putting the additional standards without changing everyone's thinking about what we're teaching in a middle school program. Mm -hmm. um, so I like that. So we will oh. definitely see what we can come up with. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Michael. Yeah, two things, one, I just want to, I want to appreciate the exchange. Mm. I think Shabazz's question was right on, and I appreciate your response. Mm. Um, two quick, uh, well, two follow-ups. One is I would agree with the, the choice of words. I was thinking mm. about that. And, you know, mm -hmm. and it struck me in terms of the high school. We have college prep, and you have, it's AP is the other one? What's honors. the other alternative? Honors. But this, honors. Honors. It's, it's honors. It's but college there, prep. There's a, a positive connotion to, to college both. prep as right. well. So like, you're not doing plain and mm -hmm. better. Um, so I think that, that was something I was thinking. As a non-educator, I just want to, this is mostly to get clarity yes. because this is a big deal. Um, I get the inequity of the high stakes test part. Right. That, that makes total sense. But it seems like the other part of it was on the one hand you were saying that you prefer the heterogeneous and that if you were starting at the right place you could achieve a, a four year trajectory. But earlier you were talking about with the current, that basically the teachers were teaching two classes because they were doing you know, the, right. the extra stuff. Right. So just so I understand it, isn't that doing the extra stuff a heterogeneous thing where you're trying to differentiate and maybe not the best way, but right. so if you just tease that out for me because it would be helpful. Right, right. So right, so currently in our current honors model, we have heterogeneous grouping, okay? And in a sense, we will still have a notion of heterogeneous grouping in, this two, in these two courses. What we're doing, in a sense, is narrowing the band. So in order for teachers, when teachers are developing skills and learning to do something that's very complex, which is if I have 25 learners, how do I ensure my instruction impacts all of them and they all come with different experiences? That problem is more complex when students have very, very different backgrounds in preparation because of, uh, I would say, because of our, you know, ours, where we are in our math education system at the elementary level. So okay. what I'm trying to do is, what we're thinking is that we're narrowing the band a little bit to make the notion of differentiation to be more doable and more successful. That's um, Before we go on, um, this is an incredibly important conversation mm -hmm. that I do not want to do anything to curtail. Let me say that up front. But we are approaching 10 o'clock, which is far beyond what time we were supposed to be at. So I'm going to ask for a motion from the committee to extend the time of our meeting so that we can take full advantage. And I know people have been here a while, but we also value what you have to say. And I want to respect and value that very, very clearly. So just to be to deal with the technicalities, I'm going to ask for a motion to extend to um, a period of time contained within the motion. Make sense? Trevor? I'll make a motion we extend this meeting for at least another half an hour to hear what uh, Dr. So Cohen I'm hearing 10.30. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Not hearing any. All those in favor of extending the meeting, please raise your hand. Mm -hmm. Those opposed? Okay, carries you. Thank you very much. And again, um, a, a value. <laughs> <laughs> he said um, he woke up. Well, now you better come up with questions and comments yeah, exactly. or I'm in real big trouble here. Um, Lawrence. No, I'm just, I just abstain. Uh, I have to get up at 5.30 oh, for school. Oh, okay. So. I'm sorry. One abstention. Comments and questions. I, I, I have one comment, if I may. Um, and maybe it's more to the audience out there than it is to you. Um, being, and I don't think there's any surprise, a very strong advocate of regionalization, 
pre-K through 12. I can't think of a more important conversation amongst many similar conversations to have than this one. But what I find incredibly frustrating about being on the region is a personal reluctance to intrude upon what is the domain of the Amherst Elementary School Committee. I always feel a reluctance to go beyond the seventh grade and mm -hmm. ask questions or make comments. Having said that, <laughs> um, go I'm going to go ahead. Um, and please tell me if I'm wrong, but I always find mathematic conversations about math fascinating because I'm not a mathematician. And I always feel like I learn a tremendous amount from people who do know about math. It's a very unique way of looking at the world. And I think it also involves a very unique understanding of the use of language and understanding of um, language, well, language acquisition, yeah. decoding, right. and ability to use language appropriately in the right context. Conversations about math always seem to me, no matter how good they are, lack a context. Mm -hmm. And that context is language, which for me goes back to pre-K. <laughs> And I guess what I'm, what I'm pitching is, as, as um, confusing as it may sound, a pitch for regionalization. Because I think this conversation needs to take place within that broader context of pre-K through 12. Because I think we're talking about seventh graders out of context. We're talking about sixth graders out of context. Mm -hmm. There's a continuity there that I don't think we, we talk about. Um, in a concrete way. It's very abstract if we talk about it at all. Mm -hmm. And um, I think given the importance that our country is placing on mathematics and the development of mathematical skills and ability and transferability to the real world context, regionalization takes on an incredibly greater importance to me. Th mm -hmm. This conversation must take place when we meet again as a committee, a pre-K through 12 committee so that we can talk about this, not just in terms of sixth and seventh graders, but pre-K, kindergarten, one through five, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just my pitch. Mm -hmm. It's not a question, it's a comment. <laughs> um, but I thought this was, I, I always feel when I'm, uh, that I'm, I'm, I'm being elevated to a new level of mathematical understanding when I participate in these mm -hmm. discussions or participate in these um, opportunities to listen to people who know what they're talking about. Um, thank you very, very much. But I do think that context is missing. Okay. Trevor. Thank you. In this uh, solemn discussion about mathematics <laughs> and um, in the interest of being accurate, I want to make sure that we correct and remind uh, uh, everyone that <coughs> we unanimously, 100% mathematics, voted on K through six. And so to, uh, just to, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but just to rephrase that as in a conversation of how a K through six region would feed into a seventh grade in a, in a line this way, rather than um, um, choosing our words to have folks you know, think that it was the other way. So I just wanted to mm -hmm. make sure I threw that in, especially since we mathematics and language, you have to be accurate. May, I, may I comment yeah, on that? Please. I know what I meant. You and what I meant was pre-K through 12. Mm -hmm. so, wait, let me finish, please. Mm -hmm. What I meant was pre-K through 12. We may have voted for a pre-K through 6. Unanimous. Yeah. But, but I still believe that the proper context to have this conversation is a pre-K through 12 context, not a pre-K through 6 and a 7 through 12. That's, what, that's where I'm coming from. Thank you. Um, I want to um, comment on Mr. Shabazz when he brought to the surface underlying kind of what's be, what's this model and kind of why there's an aspect of it that's problematic is that it's really going to be really important for you to understand what the principles are about why for right now in this time of why this is a helpful move here's why next year we're not going to be perfectly successful with this I can guarantee you that the first year is going to look different from the second year. Mm -hmm. But if we, can under, like if we understand and ask questions and continue to probe, 
what are we trying to do in our system? What are the tools that are going to allow us? We would, ha in this model, it's flexible grouping. But what does it mean for a middle school to have flexible grouping when there's real, real complications with scheduling and teaming because our notion at the middle school is a team mm -hmm. structure? Mm -hmm. So the kinds of complications that go in to make this happen for next year is that one model could be that a classroom teacher in, in seventh grade teaches one section that is this, I'm going to call it the A group and the B group, mm -hmm. so they're vanilla. Mm -hmm. And that would put us in a situation where 25, only 25% 25 of the students could be in the A group, let's say there were four sections, and 75% would be. So the only way we could make a movement and have the students move mm -hmm. is that we'd either have a situation where a teacher had a, a classroom that was much larger than the others. Mm -hmm. That doesn't meet our criteria of flexible grouping. <coughs> so the kinds of conversations we've had to talk about is that if students were in the B group, which is say the B group <coughs> is the smaller group, what would it look like if they came from different teams, mm -hmm. if you're following the logic, mm -hmm. then that actually would give us more flexibility that we could add one more section. We could have one teacher who teaches two sections of a B class. So I'm giving that as an illustration of the complication to take an idea that's rooted in the belief, not just the belief, but in the understanding that high quality math instruction is about having teachers who know how to meet the needs of all students. We're trying to create the conditions to have that happen sooner rather than later to be successful because ultimately if we're not I can assure you who is going to miss out mm -hmm. the quality of the experience of what students have in the middle school so we have always concept like our conversations have always been where do we want to end up mm -hmm. and then what are the right now what have been the bar what has been a barrier that's allowing it to make it very difficult to kind of stand through what we know would be good to design a program so I do consider this a piece of a much larger Ag agenda or commit, I wouldn't say it's agenda, it's a commitment in this school district mm -hmm. to remove barriers of entry <coughs> to all of our courses. Okay. Oh, yeah. I see. Could I just, and I'll just preview, it's probably our May, so mm -hmm. this conversation around 6, 7, 8 sets up a larger conversation for 9 through 12, and it then creates different opportunities for the number of options going into grade 9, mm -hmm. and then we come out with a whatever that might be, a sequence for probably the following. Mm -hmm. Can I say that? That's a lot of work, yeah. but that's where we are because everything we're doing here is now setting up for changes and shifts. Is that fair to say? Yeah, that is what is. Mm -hmm. It's, it's sure. really. This is, this it's, is very it's hard. massive to, shifts. Massive work on the part of the teachers yes. and the organization to make this a reality. Very few districts. Will undertake would this undertake this time. kind of a change. And in this period of time in particular, we'll take the change or the time frame. Lawrence. Just a quick question. Since you mentioned that, Maria, so Mark has left, but a year ago, I believe, he said that he had given mm -hmm. the math department at the high school the task of looking into uh, rethinking, finding some kind of center that would be between the traditional pathway and the uh, sorry, my daughter's in it now. Yeah, I am P. Thank you. Uh, is is are we stepping away from that? Or are we are we is that where are we at with that? Right. Just what I was foreshadowing. So, so really, the uh, charge is to go to one pathway. Right. Yeah, one pathway. Right. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. That's yes, that's right. Yeah, it was one <laughs> pathway. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, the charge was really to go to one, one pathway, pathway. and. Um, so the pathway needs to support the Common Core, Core. standards. Right, so that. that that's our charge, um, but it's a much more, as you can tell, complicated yeah. issue because we really had to start with, with. you know, the, all the way the going from K right. to 12. So next year is really implementing some of the middle school changes, and then the hope is the following year that we'll be able to implement yes. the high school changes. And then I have a follow-up, and I think, I, and this, and what people can't lose sight of is that even if there's one pathway, it doesn't mean differentiation is lost. Exactly, mm -hmm. okay. yes. You would still be having the accelerated courses, students entering into the AP courses, um, yes. but with many less routes to get there. Yeah. Less okay. barriers. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
thought I saw it. Yeah, Shabazz. And so this is a May discussion we have mm -hmm. coming up. Okay, then I can kind of hold there because what I, what's been going around in the community is that that one pathway is all IMP, and there's a lot of concerns that that's going the wrong direction. We haven't even started looking at curriculum yet, so I'm not saying that IMP isn't something we would look at, but there's a lot of curriculums out there that support the mm -hmm. Common Core standards, and so you know as as we've um, done our work and we're ready to start reviewing curriculums, then we will be going through um, many curriculums to decide on the best fit. Thank you. One, one kind of takeaway or one way to kind of to, uh, to kind of begin to understand like what does this process look like is that just like at the middle school we've been saying that we have to identify which standards are being taught in seventh and eighth grade and what portion of the high school standards would, would presumably make its way into the middle school. When we go to look at the high school program, it's the same process of identifying which standards and how do they get clustered together. And why is that, and what, it's gonna be a very interesting process. Because remember that idea where we have the four years have to be put into three years of a course? Mm -hmm. So you have to organize things. Mm -hmm. We also said something like, it's pretty common that if you wanna support advanced students in math, that they wanna double up. Mm -hmm. If in fact, you only create a sequence that you have to do the first thing, the second thing, and the third thing, it's pretty hard because of the way we set it up to double up. So we have to design, not only do we have to take the four years and put it in three years, look at the opportunity that we could have a course sequence where students could take two math courses simultaneously and not disrupt their kind of developmental ideas in mathematics. Mm -hmm. So that analytically is the work that the high school has to figure out which is, it's, which is actually a parallel process to what we're doing at the middle school. Mm -hmm. So this is a precursor to how, you, we, how a school district sets this up, mm. but based on standard, that's why that notion I say this word, like standards based, mm -hmm. it's actually the tool that allows you to ensure that you're going in a logical way for kids. Mm -hmm. And that, so that's why we're not in, like just like we couldn't even look for materials till we figured out what we needed, yeah. we can't figure out and who knows what's going to be in the field yeah. by the time the system is ready to purchase materials for high school. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and there's an interesting part of this is that there's something advantageous to see what every day more people are getting into this piece about how do you create high school level math materials that are aligned to the new standards. Mm -hmm. So there is a little bit of a, you wait and you... It, there is a piece about you, you basically that's why the cohorts really matter it's you meet the needs of the cohorts and then you look what's the most thing available at that point in time because I, I guaranteed you I said I couldn't promise you that everyday math would be here for a decade because we knew that there were too many pieces moving but it was the best thing available from last year and even today if I had to make the decision now we would still say nothing new because this field is a little bit waiting to align your curriculum with the assessments Thank you very, very much. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you very much. Yeah. And now you need sleep. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you morning. for staying. Yes. <laughs> thank we you. really thank appreciate you. it. Thank you very, very yeah, much. Yeah, very much. Um, <laughs> thank you, members of the committee, for yes. spending the time. Um, we're going to skip over policies mm -hmm. uh, until the 23rd. Yeah. Um, we do have to accept gifts. Yep. Um, yeah. Rick? Now moved. there's an Amherst and then there's a region, yeah. so. Um, Rick could do both. You could do, do both, Rick, one at a time? Um, I moved for this <coughs> for the region. I moved to accept in-kind donation from John Vance to the high school athletics high jump standards. Is there a second? Sorry. Discussion? All in favor? Carries unanimously. Rick? For the Amherst School Committee, I move to accept a donation from Colin and Bridget Rue. R U H E um, to support the Betty Affey Art Scholarship Fund for hundred dollars. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Thank you. Unanimous. Um, Michael, a quick update on the Regional School District Planning Board. If you, you can talk fast. <laughs> Please do. A few hours ago, I was going to do it. Slowly. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, there's three pieces just to frame it. Mm -hmm. So we met last Sunday. Um, the thing for you all to know is between now and June 30th, the focus of the work is really building two things, the regional agreement 
um, because we, based on funding, we have to get the legal work done by June 30th. So it's crunch time in terms of looking at stuff. We have a process of dealing with some of the core issues like governance, et cetera. Um, and then the other key component is the educational plan, which has to get um, delivered to the ESC, which Maria is going to take the lead on and then confer with the educational committee. So that's sort of the short version. Um, in terms of timing, just, and I would actually, I know you've been invited to these things before, but these actually might be more important, is we're having two meetings where we're going to basically look at the regional agreement. So the committee is going to be doing their work, coming together to look at one draft. June 1st, which is a Saturday, we're going to have a, like a, a big multi-hour meeting. Then we'll come back with additional work. June 15th, we're going to have another big meeting. And then if we need to, June 26th. But the idea is somewhere by the end of June, by, by June 26th, we'll have essentially all the concepts in a relatively comprehensive document. It won't be in legalese yet. We're going to then send it to the, the lawyer for that. But the idea is it will come out of that. So that's, that's sort of like the time part. Um, just the process piece, this is a little complicated, but what has come out in checking with the lawyers and with the ESE is that, as Trevor pointed out, you know, there was a unanimous agreement to create the pre-K six region, but for three towns. Um, the regional agreement is going to be written so that Shootsbury could join in um, by right. And so what we learned from DESE is that if Shootsbury were to vote in December of any year, it could then join in July subsequent. So, for example, if it voted in December 2013, it could join in a new pre-K-6 region July 1st when everyone else starts. So we could start together. Um, and that would hold for any year. The thing that the ESC said was, in writing the regional agreement, you want to have a limited window where you do that by right. So it was suggested that three years, so that it doesn't just, <coughs> apparently there was one region where it was 20 years, it just got extended, which is crazy. Hmm. So after the three year window, so if, if Shootsbury didn't act, the three towns would have to vote to amend the regional agreement. But the complexity <coughs> is that we're writing the regional agreement so that it's good for three towns, and if Shootsbury voted, it would something would kick in for four towns. So that's sort of the process. Um, DESC would approve it in December and Jan or January this year, and then presumably if it was approved, the region would start July 1st, 2014. So there's a six-month implementation stage. So just yeah. So but the town, town meeting still have to decide in the fall. Yes, in November. Mm -hmm. Yes. November, okay. the, for mm -hmm. Amherst, Pelham, and Lever, the vote would be in November. In November okay. And then Shootsbury would have until December 31st to vote. And just to clarify, in Amherst, it would be a town-wide meeting. Uh, oh, it's a ballot. Right. Okay. It's a ballot. Okay. 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 Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank and you. then the thing that's most important, I think, for this body um, is in the last few days, we've, there's been <coughs> these working groups that we focused on, so governance and finance and stuff. But there's a lot of other issues that need to be in the regional agreement because if you just look at cost <coughs> allocation for the central office. So right now, region Amherst and Pelham all share the cost of the central office. So if you had two regions, you've got mm -hmm. to figure out, well, what's the cost allocation between pre-K-6 and 712? Um, and so there's the way that this is just the complex part, and then we can disconnect. So there's a lot of specific things that we need to get written into the regional agreement by June 30th, the hiring process, the cost allocation. There's a whole bunch of things that mm -hmm. Kip and I were saying we need to make a launch us to figure out what that is. You write it in. Um, the governance issue which is once, and we've talked about this before, but once a pre-K region, pre-K-6 region gets created, there would be school committees to then appoint to us. So we'd have to change that. That timing does not have to be June 30th. In fact, what we would probably do is postpone that because it's only as of, so if DES approves the new region in January of 2014, there's still a six months period where the regional school committee, this regional school committee, would have to come up with a plan approve it, have the towns amend it, and be in place for July 1st. So it was six months before we were out of compliance. So in terms of sequencing with the regional school committee, the idea would be to identify the issues that need to get built into a regional agreement now. Um, and then again, you could we could save those changes because when we amend our regional agreement in, in spring 2014, we would just do it whole, you know, all together. But we want to identify it for getting it into the pre-K-6 mm -hmm. regional agreement through June 30th, and then and so the, the last thing is, Kip is going to work with Andy Steinberg, who's the chair of the Regional School District mm -hmm. Planning Board, to figure out what the timing of the process is, which 
it's only been a couple of days of identifying this stuff. So, but the, the key would be that this body here is going to have to approve stuff and, and buy into some of the changes, whether it's cost allocation, the hiring superintendent, all that kind of stuff. So we just have to figure out the timing by which that gets figured out and gets brought forth here. So there's some coordination, but we haven't quite gotten it. Um, but some has to be by June 30th, and then we don't have to amend it until the spring. So that's the deal. Thank you, Michael. Um, I just had two little pieces. One is um, learning almost daily um, how detailed the regional agreement must be, um, borderline minutia. Um, and so Michael's point about three categories of governance, finance, and education are one way of beginning to identify um, where certain items go, very detailed items go, and, and also can um, by, by categorizing them, also see linkages from governance to finance and finance to government and so on and so forth. But um, it's really getting down to the details now. The second point is um, that um, I think it would be in the interest of the regional committee as a committee, with all due respect to all of you as individuals, that we wait until after all town meetings have taken place because the composition of this group could change by as much as a third, um, <coughs> depending upon how town meeting votes go. So mm -hmm. I don't think we will be coming forward um, uh, asking you to um, consider a proposal, but it will probably not be until after June 1. Thank you, Michael. Any questions for Michael? If not, then, um, as I said, we will um, put off the policies for um, the 23rd. Mm -hmm. I will send out an email to members of the policy subcommittee from possible dates for us to uh, convene. And unless you have calendar items, uh, motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. 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 All those in favor? We are adjourned. Thank you very, very much, folks. Thank you.